स्टार्ट करो Good morning, everyone. The ongoing global COVID-19 pandemic has been vital in demonstrating the interrelationship between the environment and human health. It has highlighted the significant of significance of strengthening the endeavor focused on environmental health. At one end of the pandemic, are dropping the levels of pollution due to the lockdown measures, whereas on the other hand, it has also provided cover for illegal activities. such as deforestation poaching and also hindered environmental diplomacy efforts therefore it is crucial that the global governance of environment is reconsidered and revamped in view of current pandemic on behalf of environmental cell of bharti vidyapeet deemed to be university new law college pune i welcome our guest of honor for the day honorable dr vandana shiva madam an indian scholar environmental activist activist and founder navdhanya international italy i also extend a warm welcome to our esteemed dignitaries mr siddhant prasad lecturer op jindal global university mr nasir ali teacher at politic johar university dr sadna sunil mahashabde chairperson of global environmental solution ngo ms krishni apado lecturer Mauritius Law University and Ms Mini Jain Director Flow Partnership UK I request Dr Bhagishri Deshpande madam to render the welcome address Good morning everyone and thank you Dr Dharma Dr Patanjali Kadam a gigantic visionary was well aware of the fact that the social justice to school education of the masses was indispensable and hence he established the bharti vidyapeet deemed to be university his aim was to open the avenues of various branches of education to the less fortunate this mission is still carried forward by the tremendous zeal and tireless efforts by honorable dr shivaji rao kadam chancellor bharti vidyapeet deemed to be university and honorable dr vishwaji ji kadam pro vice chancellor and security and secretary bharti vidyapeet and minister of maharashtra state for social justice and special assistance honorable balasaheb's efforts to secure social justice to the masses are unequivocal bharti vidyapeet deemed to be university is a university of high repute and functions on the practices of academic excellence blended with the essence and spirit of humanity bharti vidyapeet a plus grade by nac and is ranked 63rd by the nrf bharti vidyapeet new law college is one of the top ranked colleges of india the spectacular aspect of new law college is that apart from dispensing the academic content it tries to inculcate the habit of practically implementing the content of the theoretical principles hence we not only give discourses on the environmental law and the related issues but we strive to make the society aware as to how their actions or activities may cause environmental pollution the bharti vidyapeet new law college has established the environmental cell and the goal of the environmental cell is to prohibit the masses from indulging into uneco friendly actions to ensure clean environment along with the legal provisions it is absolutely mandated that the people abide by the law and indulge only in eco friendly activities our aim is to reduce the human actions which are in conflict 
with the environment and to substitute them with human actions which are in consonance or in conformity with the environment it should not be man versus environment but it should be man in clean environment bharti vidyapeeth new law college cell though of recent origin has on its agenda to contribute significantly to the mammoth task of environment protection and for this it has undertaken various activities and conducted various programs Uh, the environmental cell with the help of the able coordinators has successfully conducted the field work related to the legal and factual issues of the sadhana territory and the surrounding suburb areas in maharashtra currently the environment cell is working on the white paper on the mula mutha river of the district in furtherance of the project to rejuvenate the river the objective of this international conference is to try to try and comprehend the global issues of environment in this pandemic era so that the environmental cell can further its objective to make the people aware of the dire requirement to indulge only in eco friendly activities i am sure that the expert opinion of today's speakers will give direction and inputs to our cell we are really very honored to have the team speakers of today and it is indeed an intellectual treat for all of us who are enthusiastically and eagerly waiting to hear all the renowned speakers so thank you i request dharma madam to take over thank you madam it is my pleasure to introduce our guest of honor dr vandana shiva madam is an indian scholar environmental <coughs> community advocate and anti globalization author she received her master degree in the philosophy of science from gulf university ontario in 1976 the thesis hidden variables and non available non locality in quantum theory earned her a doctorate from the department of philosophy at the university of western ontario in 1978 professor dr vandana shiva trained as a physicist In 1982, she founded an independent institute, the Research Foundation for Science, Technology, and Ecology in Dehradun, which is dedicated to highly quali- high quality and independent research to address the most significant ecological and social issues of our times. In 1991, she founded Navdhani, a national movement to protect the diversity and integrity of living resources, especially native seeds. In 2001, Madam opened Beach Vidya Peet, a school and organic farm, offering month-long courses in sustainable living and agriculture near Dehradun. Madam has contributed in fundamental ways to changing the practice and paradigm of agriculture and food. Her book, The Violence of Green Revolution, and Monocultures of the Mind, have become basic challenges. to the dominant paradigm of non sustainable and reductionist agricultural practice dr shiva is a founding board member of many important organization such as the international forum on globalization and diverse women for diversity time magazine identify her as an environmental hero in 2003 she received the right livelihood award in 1993 and 2010 sydney peace prize i consider it my distinct privilege to request madam to address the gathering ma'am please thank you very much greetings to all of you i was very happy to hear that your college is related to the vidya bhavans and uh, I have a connection with K M Munshi. When K M Munshi ji was the governor of Uttar Pradesh, he used to come and spend. He and his wife used to come and spend their summers in Chakrota, where my father was the forest officer, and they became very, very friendly. Um, in fact, Mrs. Munshi had named me Shanti when I was born, but I didn't like the name too much later, and named myself Vandana. Um, 
My parents named themselves Shiva because they were fighting against caste. And that close association with K. Munshi has shaped my own work. I did physics. I did quantum theory. 84, when the Bhopal disaster took place and Punjab erupted in violence, I was compelled to look at what was going wrong with agriculture. And uh, I was working then for the United Nations University uh, in a program on conflicts over resources. And that's when I wrote the book for the UNU, which is titled, The Violence of the Green Revolution. And it's very much connected to the theme you're addressing, but because the introduction was given to Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan, I realized that I looked at all the old books in my parents' library and there were three or four reports and books by K. M. Munshi. And there was one that totally removed the puzzle of why the Green Revolution had gone wrong, why it had caused so much violence in Punjab. And this is K. M. Munshi writing in 1951, a year before I was born. Study the life cycles in the village under your charge in both aspects, hydrological and nutritional. Find out where the cycle has been disturbed and estimate the steps necessary for restoring it. Work out the village in all its aspects. Restoring life cycles is the main work. You will remember we had been devastated by British rule. They had transferred $45 trillion from India, leaving us in famine, leaving your region with Deccan riots. And 47 to 51 is just four years. His vision was already about healing, but healing society, healing the country by healing the land, by healing the nutrition and uh, hydrological cycles. This has of course been my work in Chipko, but Kemshi placed exactly where the ecological issue related to the contemporary crisis, including the pandemic, in an industrial chemical agribusiness model, globalized for greed, how it is connected. So let me now shift to the pandemic. We now know from all the research, and I wrote a piece called Ecological Reflections on the Coronavirus. It's available on my blog. You all can see it. Um, I wrote it as soon as this started. And it was so clear that the 300 new infectious diseases have been pushed from the forest to humans. I don't like to call them zoonotic diseases because not animals throwing diseases at us. We are invading their homes. We are invading the forest. Even in Karnataka, there's something called the monkey disease, where as the forests were destroyed, the ticks from the monkey started to move into the villages, which when the forests were rich, they never did. Even in our garden that my mother planted, and my mother worked closely with K.M. Munshi, and he's written a forward to a beautiful book that I brought out in 150 years of Gandhi's birth anniversary. The book is called Beheno Se Do Baate, or Gandhi Ke Updesh. My mother planted trees. We have wonderful monkeys coming and getting more of the mangoes than we can get. It's because we've destroyed their homes, we've just invaded. And if you think of it, what has been the biggest reason for invading into forests in the last 30 years? All infectious diseases spread in humanity is in the last 30 years, the new ones. And the 30 years is the year of period of globalization. I have dealt a lot of work on, did a lot of work on this on the GATT, on the WTO, and I'm going to be evaluating the new ordinances because sadly, India has taught the world how to do an agriculture without destroying nature. In fact, enriching nature. Sir Albert Howard's book, The Agricultural Testament, was written when he was sent to India in 1905. And he says, I can't teach these people. I will make the Indian peasant my professor. Organic farming spread in the world as our way of doing farming without destroying the land, the earth. 
increasing biodiversity. We want 200,000 rice varieties out of one grass. Look. Amazon is being destroyed for GMO soya. And it's bad to eat. It's being destroyed for palm oil. In Indonesia, the rainforest. I'm not going to go into details of what this has meant. I've had to do satyagrahs, very much in Gandhi spirit, including a satyagraha for Gandhi's Khan, which was shut down because it didn't have a lab and two chemists employed. Gandhiji and his purity and his fight for truth needs a lab. Industrial oil production doesn't just need a lab and scientists. In fact, we shouldn't be eating industrial oil because so much of the literature is now shown that the, the ultra processed food, including refined oils, are a big reason for chronic diseases. So you're invading into the forest, creating infectious diseases, invading into our bodies, causing chronic diseases. And this toxic problem is destroying the health of the planet. And it is destroying our health too. And in my ecological reflections, I've written, there's only one health. One health in one planet related to biodiversity, related to respect for nature. Your theme of your conference, is global governance. We have institutions for global governance. We have laws for global governance to have avoided this. I was part of the writing of the Convention on Biological Diversity. If it had been respected, we wouldn't be having the pandemic. But it was violated because another treaty was written the WTO, in 92 at the Earth Summit, we said we need one agreement, uh, one institution, a world environment institution, which brings together the Montreal Protocol, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Climate Treaty, the desertification, brings together the Oceans Agreement into one, because the planet is one integrated whole. We were told there isn't enough money to create a new institution. And three years later, they created the World Trade Organization. When the history of destruction of the planet, of this pandemic is written, the rules of the WTO will be a very big contributor because these are rules of deregulation. They're the kind of rules that were shaped by the East India Company. They're rules that come through invasion, colonization, greed, violence. They are the opposite of our way of doing economy. We weren't 25% of the world's economy through violence. We were 25% of the world's economy through nonviolence. And we were reduced to 2% because a violent economy declared itself an economy. And it's not an economy. It is colonialism. It is war. It is a destruction of the planet. And I have worked on a new declaration on the laws of Mother Earth. It's available in uh, a new book which has synthesized 25 years work on intellectual property, on laws and biodiversity, on biopiracy cases, on um, farmers' rights, and this law of the rights of Mother Earth. In India, it's called Origin. Internationally, it's called Reclaiming the Commons. And, uh, and in this rights of Mother Earth, we are basically coming back to the roots of our civilization, but informing the world. And it is so clear that we are in a deep, deep mess because we have given rights to something that doesn't exist. A corporation is not a person. Before the East India Company, there were businesses. Before the East India Company, there was trade. And we were the most prosperous trading nation. After the East India Company, corporations started to rule the world. And they're a fiction. They're a piece of paper. Queen Elizabeth was asked to put a signature on a charter for the East India Company, a bunch of 300 thieves, merchant adventurers, they were called. And they got together and said, oh, the spices of India, we want to trade in it and become rich. The textiles of India, we want to become, uh, trade in it and become rich. And they impoverished India. They pushed 60 million to suicide. And right now, instead of taking lessons from the pandemic, Instead of respecting the laws of global governance, 
for the planet, the biodiversity law, the climate treaty. They Two days ago, I was briefing the UK parliament. Every day you see a new step of deregulation. And just like in Britain, exactly the same thing is happening today and you are a law university I would request you all to not just look at the laws of global governance on um, on biodiversity on, on conserving the resources of the planet but most importantly the new laws of intellectual property if you go to my blogs you will see my earth journey it's my 50 years of journey from the Chipko days of the forest protection in my home in the Himalaya to the Green Revolution period, biopiracy, the GMOs, the BT cotton that is working with villagers to distribute desi seeds, do ecological agriculture, work with the Gandhi ashrams in Seva Gram and Vardha. Uh, and Vardha. And the farmers are earning 10 times more than those who are growing Bt cotton. The Bt cotton farmers are in debt. Their soils are dead. The pollinators are dead. The soils have lost 60% of their microbiome. And the farmers are being pushed to suicide. We don't have to go that way. There is another way. Our civilization evolved it over 10,000 years. It was renewed during the freedom struggle by people like Gandhi and other freedom writers. It was kept alive after freedom by amazing people like K.M. Munshi. If you are an institution inspired by that vision, I would request you to anticipate. It's not enough to react after the colonizers. We've got to prevent the new colonization. And the new colonization is the colonization of life. When I started Navdani and started to save seeds, it's because I did not accept the new illusion that corporations which are a fiction are now going to declare themselves as inventors and creators of life. I said, no, but you don't invent life. Life is not inventable. Bija is that which rises from itself forever and ever and ever. Bija, that's what it means. And you say it's your machine that you invented? No, Mr. G uh, Monsanto, you're not going to have your way. And I'm so glad we wrote laws. It's in this book origin. I would request you to teach your students India's patent law, Article 3J. Plants, animals, and seeds are not patentable. The next step of this, earlier they did it through genetic engineering. Now they are doing it by treating life as a digital program by mining data. Data is the new oil. Intellectual property rights to data is the way life is being invaded. And this will not reduce the destruction. Because I do this work, I follow it every day, every day, new tricks. So fake food made in a lab with giant sized farms, with GMO seeds, spring of Roundup, no farmers, no one to take care of the earth. We've already become a sick planet and sick people. If we go further down this line of poisoned food and fake food, we will be very, very sick. But of course, there are few companies that will walk away with super wealth. The toxic companies that sell chemicals are the same as the pharma companies that sell medicines. They give you cancer, then they make money out of cancer. They create pandemics through disease, and then they have the vaccines ready for super profits. The intellectual property rights issue on vaccines is going to be very intense, but equally intense is the data collection from our bodies and our minds in the name of our health. The patent I've mentioned in my art journey is patent number 6606606. Granted in March at the peak of the pattern or of the pandemic. And it talks about mining our brain activity and our bodily functions, processing. We become users. Human beings lose their autonomy. The earth loses her autonomy. 
It gets sucked out, processed through algorithms, and they're going to then decide what we are worth. So not only do we lose the planet, we lose our humanity. We are at a crux and institutions like yours carrying this very beautiful legacy of this land, our ecological civilization, have a big role to play. As Gandhi has said, the planet has enough for everyone's needs, but not for a few people's greed. I will be very happy to send you my piece that I've written for our farmers, the farmers we work, work with. What a true art the Nirvana from the ground up, from the peasant's eyes, not from the eyes of the colonizing corporation, but from the land, sacred mother earth, from the amazing hardworking Anathas. That Atnirbhar Bharat is what we must create. Remembering Kaya Munshi, remembering Ali, remembering everyone who went before us. We are custodians of an amazing legacy. We cannot afford to let it decay. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your rich, invaluable thoughts and avid insights. It gave us a completely new perspective on the topic with a very important message that environmental conservation is inextricably linked with social action. Respected ma'am, we at the Environment Cell of Bharti Vidya Peet, deemed to be University New Law College Pune, see in you our idol and venerate all your efforts because they are the rightful manifestation of values like empathy, morality, and selflessness. Respected ma'am, from the bottom of our hearts, we express our thankfulness to you for taking out time from your busy schedule and gracing the penultimate day of our conference. Thus, echoing the emotions of every student, every faculty member, and every staff associated with the Bharati Vidya Peet family, we say thank you. Thank now, you. Now, may I now request all our participants to switch on their cameras for a group photo, please. Thank you. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we now proceed to the next session of our conference. And for this, we are joined today by a youth icon whose proclivity for hard work is an inspiration for many. Mr. Siddharth Prasad, a man of high caliber, sir has completed his education from all the top universities of the world, like Cambridge and University of Edinburgh. His multidimensional and all round personality is reflected by his distinction of having played professional cricket and organizing international events affiliated to the United Nations. Well versed in six languages, Sir is presently serving as a lecturer in law at OP Jindal Global Universities. Sir's affinity to law and his legal bent of mind has been sharpened under the guidance of high court judges and top law firms of the world. A masterful orator and a champion debater Sir has been showered with awards like the Scots Law Society Prize, Hasty Stable Best Orator, Orator Prize, both from the University of Edinburgh. We welcome you, sir, to this conference, and may we now request you to kindly address this gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Harsh. Um, I hope I'm audible to everyone, and um, let me start by thanking you for those very kind words. I think they paint me in better light than I really am, but um, I'll accept them with, uh, with humility. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking Dr. Jyoti for the uh, warm invitation she extended to me and the principal, Dr. Bhagashri, for, um, for, welcoming, for welcoming me to this conference. It's, it's always really challenging to speak after someone as eloquent and well-informed and accomplished as Dr. Shiva, but I'll have a go anyway. Um, now, when I was thinking about this topic, I thought long and hard about it. Global environmental governance in the pandemic era. And it was a bit like an exam question. 
I was taken back to my student days and I thought about it like I would at an, at a, at an exam center. There's so many approaches that you can take to answering this question. And there's indeed so much you can say when we start to talk about the globe. But if you try and talk about everything, you're going to run out of time and you're probably not going to get a very good mark. So here's a little bit of a tip for students. Don't try and put everything you know about the subject onto a piece of paper. But since I'm not being marked on this speech and on this paper, I thought I would approach this topic a little bit more esoterically. Now, fundamentally, I think we can approach this topic from two perspectives. One is from the rather formal perspective of global governance in the sense of governance of the environment at the global level. Uh, that's the institutions, the procedures, the multilateral um, environmental agreements, all of those at the global level that serve to regulate and govern um, environmental protection across the globe. The second way we can look at it is to explore what is happening across the globe. So to take a narrow view of this topic and think about how different countries across the globe are reacting to the pandemic when it comes to environmental governance. So in the course of my talk, I'd like to touch on both those perspectives if I can. But before I do that, I'd like to do a bit of perspective framing. When we think about the global environment, we have a tendency to lose scale, uh, lose sight of the scale of the globe. But this is, this is predictable because we are so used to using abstractions. We are used to talking about such a large planet, 195 countries, 7.8 billion people with one word, global. We're used to dividing up the world into four neat segments, the global north, south, east, west, continents. Now, all these abstractions, what they do is shield from our view the true picture and the details that left behind. The true picture is, like I said, that of 195 countries, 7.8 billion people. But think about it yourself. When we talk about the global environmental, uh, when we talk about global things, when we talk about the global environment, what do we usually think about? We usually resign ourselves to thinking about a few narrow regions of the world. Either we talk about ourselves in the sense of our country, our India, or we talk about some of the other major players in the global sphere. We talk about America, we'll talk about China, Russia, sometimes some of the East Asian nations like South Korea, but that we hardly ever talk about the rest of the world. And that's three fourths of the globe we are ignoring. Now, why we do this is understandable, not just because of the abstractions, but because of the way in which climate change works. We know that some countries like India and China contribute disproportionately to climate change. So it's okay to, to shed a little bit more light on these countries. But what we do is not just shed a bit more light, we completely engulf our vision in these few narrow regions. And when we do that, we ignore a very, very big portion of the world, both in terms of causes to climate change, but also in terms of the effects. So the first point I'd like to make is that we must remind ourselves constantly that there is more to this world, more to this global topic that we're talking about today than just the few narrow countries that we're so accustomed to talking about. There are Pacific countries, there are countries in East Africa, and often, these countries contain the most vulnerable people. I've spoken to people that live in the Pacific Islands and for them, climate change is the reality of their existence going below water in the next decade. Their houses, their families, everything they know being, being taken underwater. That's the reality of it. But we hardly ever talk about them. They're so underrepresented in global community circles, in negotiations, that they really, no one really thinks about them. Part of the problem though, I think is that as human beings we have become, or we always have been perhaps, very self-centered and divisive. We create these artificial boundaries along national, religious, cultural, and social lines. And then we, and then we sit inside that boundary line. We don't look outside it. We ignore those people outside the boundary line. And when we do this, we start to emphasize the differences between us and this artificially created them, instead of looking at us as one whole, one humanity. 
Now, of course, none of what I'm saying should be taken to the extreme. I'm not suggesting that no differences exist or that we ought to view the world as one economic unit, all of those things. Let's not take me to the extreme here. Let's try and understand what I'm saying in perspective. All I'm saying is that when we divide up the world using um, artificially created distinctions, we start to lose sense of the things that unite us together. And the one thing that unites us together is the effects of climate change. People in India are going to be just as affected as people in other parts of the world. And like I said, some people, like those in the Pacific states, are going to be even worse off than us. So why do we relegate ourselves to thinking about only ourselves? And why do we not enlarge our visions? It's very similar to what we're seeing in the racial movements right now. Why are Western lives, are Western lives more important than Eastern lives? Are white lives more important than black lives? Similarly, are the lives of those people in countries that we don't talk about less important than the, than the lives of those in the countries that we do talk about? I don't think so. And yet the way we treat them leads to what we call environmental discrimination and environmental racism. And so before I go on to approach this topic directly, that's something I'd like everyone to reflect on here. What we mean of, what we mean when we speak of the world in global terms, and to keep in mind the true scale of the topic that we're talking about. And if we can do this, we start to develop compassion. We start to connect with other people that are having similar problems. And in that we find solace. We also find ways to work together. And at the end of all of it, we end up creating a healthier and more egalitarian world. And this really is an extension of Ms. Shiva was talking about really, but at a much larger level. So here's food for thought. Now, moving on from this, I'd like to start with the second perspective, which I mentioned at the start, which was looking at how environmental governance has played out in specific areas around the globe during this pandemic. And I'm going to talk about a region which we don't talk about very much, and that's southern Iraq. Now, how many times have any of you thought about the global environmental problem and thought, well, let me think about what's going on in southern Iraq? And yet it's so important. The emissions that are coming from southern Iraq amount for 10% of the world's global CO2 emissions that come from flaring. That's, that's quite a lot. That's 30 million tons of CO2. And yet we barely talk about it. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. Now, the air in the towns of southern Iraq are filled with noxious chemicals. And these chemicals come from a practice known as flaring. A flaring is a process in which you burn the natural gas that comes out when you're extracting oil. Now, what you, what you would typically like to do in an ideal scenario is capture this gas. And if you capture this gas, we know that natural gas has many uses, power generation, fertilizers, and so on. And so you use it for that purpose. Um, but when you don't have that capture technology, what you do is burn it. And that's what Iraq is doing in a practice called flaring. Now, the chemicals that come out of this flaring process are very, very poisonous indeed. They've been known to cause cancer, particular forms of really dangerous cancer, worse than asthma, um, increase hypertension, and speed up climate change, as I said, because of the immense amounts of CO2 that are coming. And when you hear the stories of the people in southern Iraq, you really start to feel pity for them. People in southern Iraq never see the darkness of night because their skies are always lit up with a hue of orange from the flames that are being burnt with the natural gas. Every family, almost every family in southern Iraq knows somebody that has suffered from cancer and they don't have the money to treat those people that get ill. Cancer treatments are expensive and these people aren't, aren't rich. They're far from it. They can't go outside. They can't till their land, they can't farm because their soil has been rendered completely useless by all the chemicals that come up from the air. So they live in a really, really sad, sad state. The other paradox in Iraq is that despite the abundance of natural gas, all this natural gas that they burn, mind you for no, no reason whatsoever, the burning doesn't lead to anything. 
they import natural gas. Now, this is really is a strange paradox. A country that has such a wealth of natural gas is importing natural gas. The natural gas that Iraq has is enough to power 3 million homes, and yet they can't harness it. And that's the paradox. So here you have it then. Flaring from southern Iraq causes massive environmental problems, not only locally, but at the global level, contributing to climate change. Adverse health impacts at the local level, cancer, genetic mutations, and so on. And so what do we do about it? Well, most people that are baffled by this and most environmentalists would say the solution is really easy. Why don't you just capture the gas that's coming out from these oil wells, use it to power homes, and then take whatever money you get, whatever profits you get, reinvest it into the system, and slowly start to transition into a cleaner economy, a green economy, which will eventually lead to lots of growth, lots of jobs, and the usual rhetoric that's, that's come along with it. But why, why is the solution different? It, it sounds really easy, but why is it not happening? Even the government acknowledges that what's going on environmentally is bad, that what's happening to the local population is potentially catastrophic. Now, of course, you take what governments in Iraq say with a rather large helping of sort, but I don't think they really want their people dying of cancer and their healthcare costs going up. So why aren't they able to do all of this? The answer is that transitioning to environmentally clean technologies, such as building a capture, um, a natural gas capture plant is expensive. They built one plant in Southern Iraq and that cost them $1.5 billion. And that covered up only half the oil wells in a certain region. There's 15 across Southern Iraq. So they need a lot more of these plants. And that's $1.5 billion multiplied into 10. 10.5, $12 billion is what they need to just capture the gas, to install technology to capture the gas um, that's coming out from these oil wells. Because of the pandemic, falling oil prices, Iraq is suffering from a real cash crunch. They're running a monthly budget deficit of $2.5 billion a month. So expecting them to find a billion dollars to invest in clean technology is a bit like asking a farmer in poverty to go and buy himself a Ferrari instead of a tractor. It's just not going to happen. And the same goes for transitioning to a green economy. Yes, the returns in the long term, in the long term, are high, are good. It creates jobs, cleaner economy, better impact, softer impact rather on the on the earth, and so on. But the transition takes a lot of money. And where is that money coming from? When we try to push countries like Iraq towards change. It's very easy, I think, to sit on the fence and point fingers and criticize them. And that's what I did for many years. As a law student, when I was working at NGOs, you look at these countries and go, oh, goodness me, what they're doing is terrible. They're ruining our country. But it's much more difficult to give solutions that actually reflect reality on the ground. And sure, we take what they're saying with a pinch of salt. Sure, if they make better decisions and realign their priorities, perhaps they would find some money to, to invest in cleaner technologies. But is that going to solve all their financial problems in relation to pushing towards a cleaner future? No. Now, what I'm saying is really not new. This has been the theme of environmental negotiations for the past 40 years, 30, 40 years. Every time you go to an international conference, it's the same talk. The developing countries saying to the developed countries, listen, We'll transition to a clean economy if you want us to, but give us the money and ensure that our growth is not curtailed. Now, that I think is not an unreasonable proposition, so long as their understanding is not that the growth is going to go along at the same levels at all times, whilst also creating sustainability. That dichotomy simply doesn't work. But anyway, at a reasonable level, that's, that's an acceptable proposition. Yes, you do need to create opportunities for your people, Yes, you do need to secure livelihoods. And for doing all that, you need money, technology transfers, um, and international support. And so the UNFCC, uh, FCCC set a target of $100 billion for 2020, which is a lot of, sounds like a lot of money, but when you take into account the global scale of the problem, it really isn't all that much. The reality on the ground is that we need 
more financial resources in order to assist countries that are either unable or unwilling to because of different priorities to invest money or resources in transitioning to a cleaner environment. It's no good to sell, tell these countries, well, you have to change your priorities, we're not gonna give you money because then they're not gonna do anything. If we want to be realistic, we have to support, provide support financially. And that's, that's what a lot of this regime is set up for. I worked at the Green Climate Fund. That was set up in order to provide financial aid to developing countries in order to help them mitigate and adapt against climate change. But I'm afraid the money that's going through is simply not enough. In 10 years that the Green Climate Fund has been in operation, it's raised about $18 billion. That's not enough, even enough to, create, to cover the technologies that Iraq needs, let alone cover all the environmental um, financial needs of the world. So there's a real need to think about climate finance when we're talking about global environmental governance. A lot is being done. A lot needs to be done from these countries as well in order to create, make themselves more efficient and make the transition easier. But a lot needs to be more needs to be done at a global level in order to support this transition. And Iraq is one example of a country that really, really needs this kind of support um, in order to transition. And without it, um, what we're going to see is just the situation there worsening, more people getting cancer, more CO2 and climate change being accelerated. So like it or not, um, climate finance, the need for it is a reality. So these are some of the stories of governance of environmental matters during the pandemic era. And all of this is becoming more difficult. Countries are finding it more difficult now to even invest in their own systems. Forget about giving money, having money to spare for international aid. The recovery process from the pandemic is, is, caught, is requiring so much, it's putting so much of a strain on the resources that really all of this international aid question is just being put on the side for now, but it's something we'll have to confront sooner rather than next. Now, finally, to, to finish off, I'd like to briefly turn my attention to the first topic I mentioned, which is a more direct answer to our, our theme which is that of global governance in the sense of the governing aspects at the international framework level. Now, one, one problem that actors such as UNEP, um, that's the UN environment is facing in this pandemic is implementation of their activities, field activities, monitoring, training, capacity building activities, all of those are being impacted by the crisis due to the limitations on travel and movement. So there's a real need at the global level to come up with alternative ways of continuing to work with countries to ensure that the governance and the activities outlined continue to be implemented. The flip side of all of this is that a lot of money is actually being um, saved because of reduced operations, and that can be redirected, uh, redirected rather, into um, support activities. The other problem is that there's a need to ensure that the legal and policy frameworks that we have set um, like Paris, like the CBD, like CITES, continue to be implemented within the framework of the law and that governments do not take advantage of the crisis to loosen their grip on certain environmental laws. Now, many of these treaties, like Paris, for example, have inbuilt mechanisms that allow countries to put plans forward that resonate with their own local situation. In other words, this is the evolved form of what we talk about in environmental law as CBDR, common but differentiated responsibilities, taking into account your, your individual position and then um, charting a plan towards sustainable development. So at a certain level, we expect to see some form of attention being shifted away from the sustainability front to the development front in order to get the economy back online. We, we expect that. And I suspect that within the framework of some of these conventions, there is a bit of concession made for that. What the danger is, is that this is going to go off track, that this is going to be used as an opportunity to deregulate the environment sector at a level that we really don't need to for the purposes of recovering from this pandemic. Using the excuse that is now available to them. And when that's going to start to create a bad precedent, when if countries start to get influenced by this, 
and other countries start to say, well, if country X is, is deregulating, then why should I bear the burden of fighting against climate change? I'm going to do the same. So you want to stop that domino effect from happening and global governance is really crucial for that. Ensuring that to the extent that governments are tinkering with laws, it's done strictly proportionately and only if necessary. Um, and I suspect in a lot of cases, they're really not. And you want to stop that domino effect. And when we have frameworks such as Paris um, that allow countries to set their own climate ambitions, there's a real risk that countries are going to stop becoming more ambitious and use this opportunity to, to really um, hammer away at the at their environmental norms. So at the global level, I would say that the main impact of this, the main danger of this pandemic is this fear, is, is this risk of things spiraling out of control. And um, international institutions are stepping up their efforts to keep monitoring the obligations of these actors to ensure that this doesn't happen. And now we can only wait and watch what happens, but if trends are anything to go by, we're seeing a lot of countries deregulate the environments in the name of rejigging the economy, which is a very short-sighted move. I mean, it might lead to some um, short-term economic benefits, but in the long run, it's, it's going to cause more economic loss than gain. And frankly, you don't need to do a lot of them. Um, so it's a rather unfortunate trend, and we're seeing it in India as well, draft EIA. We're seeing it in Indonesia with relaxation of um, certain laws when it comes to the trading of species. And um, I suppose we must now wait and watch what happens, but um, we'll keep our fingers crossed and, and hope that um, countries decide to use this as an opportunity to put themselves on a new path, one in which their economic re recovery is aligned with a program of sustainable environmental governance. That's that's what we can hope for, and we'll have to wait and watch if that happens. So uh, thank you very much. I don't know if, I think I might have gone slightly over time, but uh, you tend to get carried away when you talk about these topics. Uh, thank you once again for to the organizers of this conference. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to uh, continued interaction with your, with your university in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was indeed a brainstorming session. I, on behalf of Environment Cell, Bharti Vidya Pete University, New Law College, expresses our sincere gratitude towards you for taking out time from your busy schedule and enlightening us on the topic. I am sure there has been several takeaways for our attendees. Now, I would like to introduce our next keynote speaker for the day, Mr. Nasir Ali Abdullah, sir. Mr. Nasir Ali did his master's from Bharti Vidya Pete University in Environment Science. He graduated, from, he graduated in agriculture from Duhok University in Kurdistan, Iraq. Alongside, he completed his diploma in mass media and political science from Pune University. He has a keen interest in research and publication. More than 10,000 news and stories have been published by him in Drunda, in newspaper of Iraq, India. He is presently working as assistant professor in Duhok University, and he is also the officer manager of Rudolf Network Media, Duhok City. Now I would request Mr. Nasser Ali Abdullah, sir, to please address the attendees. Sir, please. Sir, may I please request you to unmute your mic? Thank you. Yeah, yes, sir. it's done. It's done, sir. Sir, sir, I guess your audio is not connected. Uh, may I request you to connect your mic 
to the system, please, sir. Uh, so uh, i would i would like to assist you in this uh, hello Hello everyone. Apologies for some technical issues on part of Sir. So we are moving ahead. Sir will join us after this. Um, now we have with us Ms. Krishni Alpado, ma'am. Ma'am is a lecturer of law at Mauritius National University with a demonstrated history of working in the higher education industry. She happens to be an eminent domain expert in environment law climate change law and policy, diplomacy, and other legal practice areas. Ma'am is presently pursuing her PhD from University of Western Australia and has been a Fulbright visiting scholar at University of California at Berkeley. Ma'am has pursued her LLB from University of London and LLM from College of Law London. Apart from this, Ma'am is author of several widely acknowledged research papers as well as publications. She is recipient of 2018 UK Alumni Award for Mauritius by British Council and has also been a selected delegate to UNESCO. Ma'am was also selected for UN Graduate Study Program of 2014. Now I may request Ma'am to address our attendees. Ma'am. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so it's a great honor and privilege to be uh, addressing you today. Um, and I'm especially thankful to uh, the new law college uh, for this opportunity. Um, so just to confirm that I'm now sharing my screen and is everyone able to um, see my screen? Yes, okay. Um, so it has been um, really nice and insightful and really inspiring to hear from Dr. Vandana Shiva and, you know, talking about the environment, nature and governance and the way she has uh, addressed us today, um, it has given us a glimpse about the need for us to consider that, you know, in the future, we need to consider a world that is in sync with nature and we are seeing that uh, as um, Mr. 
uh, Sidant uh, was uh, saying previously, governments are using uh, the pandemic as an excuse not to fulfill their obligations under international law, uh, but we should see this window uh, of opportunity to move ahead. And instead of using excuses, we are now um, having an opportunity to um, change maybe the way uh, we see governance, uh, change the way institutions work so that we can be in symbiosis in nature instead of destroying nature. So presentation, presentation, presentation is focused on the situation right now in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on the environment. And then also I will be proposing how um, governments especially can lead the way towards implementing our environmental obligations and especially the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So um, just as a background, the COVID-19 has already infected 15 million uh, around 15 million people around the world and um, since the beginning of the pandemic. And we have recorded 619, uh, 6,000, uh, uh, 150 deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. And we have seen how um, the pandemic has transformed in record time into an economic and labor market shock. So we have seen that the hardest hit industries has been the travel, the tourism and hospitality industries. And as of, as of now, in many countries, schools have been shut down, airports closed, offices and businesses have been in lockdown. So. As the new normal starts to set in with some borders reopening, education institutions re resuming their classes and some businesses getting back to the ground, uh, second waves of the pandemic are being um, feared across the world. So we have seen the uh, impact on businesses. What has been, um, you know, um, the impact on the environment? Um, so the immediate consequence of the shutting down of airports and the closing down of hotel chains acro across the world has been uh, staggering lowering in CO2 emissions around the world. So uh, I've been following um, some studies since the beginning of the pandemic and it's really uh, astonishing to see that due to the closure of airports and also you know many countries have been in lockdown so uh, people have been working from their homes so we have seen that there has been a considerable decrease in traffic on the roads, for example, and um, various studies have shown that there has been a massive drop in CO2 emissions, which is really positive for the environment. Um, so moreover, when we talk about fossil fuel industries as well, we have seen that a lot of them, uh, a lot of industries which rely on fossil fuels have either decrease their operations or we have seen some of them shut down. And um, a report from the International Energy Agency uh, this year has seen uh, has reported that the largest ever drop globally in both investment and consumer spending on energy as the coronavirus pandemic hits every major sector. Indeed, the crisis has accelerated the shutdown of fossil fuel power plants and refineries. So this is another good news for the environment. Um, so all the reports have. Uh, we agree that nature is using this time to heal and rejuvenate itself as if using this um, incredible period to get back to its former glory. Um, I was reading a news report uh, on the BBC and I quote that um, there have been reports that there's clear water in the Venice canals, blue skies over Delhi and wild animals are roaming boldly in lockdown cities. Um, so these are all the positive impact that the COVID pandemic has had on the environment. But um, has the presumable healing of nature during the pandemic been all rosy? The answer is unfortunately no. So um, there have been stark warnings that the apparent regeneration of the natural world during the COVID-19 pandemic has not all been a pretty picture all over the world and in all areas of the environment. For example, poaching and deforestation in the Amazon forests. Uh, this has been touched lightly by Dr. Vandana Shiva. We have seen reports that uh, there has been a rise in poaching and deforestation uh, and there has this has continued from the start of the pandemic uh, until now. 
Um, so moreover, what is even more alarming is that fossil fuel lobbyists have been encouraging governments, as I've said, to use the COVID-19 crisis not to meet as an excuse not to meet their obligations under international and national environmental law. And um, the Guardian has reported that COVID-19 relief for fossil fuel industries risk green recovery plans as over $500 billion is going to high carbon industries. So this undermines the goals of the COP26, um, which should have been held in November of this year in Scotland uh, and has been postponed to November 2021. And it's, it's really alarming uh, that the vast majority of the stimulus money so far announced by governments around the world is set to prop up the fossil fuel economy, according to analyst company Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, so the World Economic Forum has been following the situation closely and has been writing, uh, the analysts have been writing a lot about the environmental damage. Um, so one article uh, is entitled, Nature's Comeback, uh, No, the Pandemic Threatens the World's Wildlife. So despite promising signs that lack of human activity has led to flourishing wildlife across the world, um, we have seen that loss of income is causing some people to exploit the environment. So for example, we see that wild animals, fish and forest trees are rarely owned by anyone and they are found in uh, rural areas where policing is difficult. Uh, and most of the world's biodiversity is found in the low income countries and emerging economies of the global south and in such places the economic impacts of the pandemic are likely to be devastating for the natural world. So how uh, does the pandemic lead to loss in biodiversity that we have been seeing over the world? So um, exploiting natural resources is often the only option for the destitute as people in low income economies lose their jobs and turn to poaching and deforestation for their livelihoods. Uh, moreover, we have seen in many countries there has been um, you know, a rural exodus happening, uh, which means that more people will find themselves poorer, hungrier and more closer to exploitable wildlife than they were a few months earlier. So this is especially true in countries such as India and also in countries uh, in Latin America. So even more worrying is that surveillance and management of precious wild places is considerably weakened during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so the governments in many countries are increasing their focus on public health and they're giving less attention to enforcement of laws, especially in rural areas. Um, so moreover, adding to that is that the shutdown of global tourism has pulled the financial rug out from thousands of protected areas around the world, leaving them without an operational budget for anti-poaching surveillance and other activities. So this is why we have to ensure that conservation moves to the top of the agenda in the post-pandemic world. So the next slide talks about what must we do for the environment in the post COVID-19 new world order. So states and their respective political leaders must not relegate, as has already been said by our speakers, they must not relegate the implementation of the very essential sustainable development goals, especially those related to the environment. So we have goals um, 7, 11, 12, 13, uh, 13 relating to the climate change, uh, 14 and 15 to the background in the race towards economic recovery. Of course, um, states, uh, they need uh, to accelerate uh, you know, the economic recovery, but this should not be done at the detriment of the environment and the climate. So um, what I've been saying, I've been, in, I've been writing a lot uh, in the newspapers recently, and I've been saying that the SDGs should be given as much priority as gross domestic products, as the GDPs, so that we can proudly say that we have learned from the lessons of the pandemic to build the post-COVID-19 new world order, which should be uh, in symbiosis and in sync with every aspect of our rich biodiversity and ecology. So uh, in Mauritius, for example, we have seen that the government uh, with the budget and in line with the recovery strategies, uh, the government is adopting uh, green stimulus packages. Okay, that uh, is helping uh, to frame policies 
uh, which would enable the private sector to jump on the clean energy bandwagon to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels such as coal, oil and gas. Um, so um, the OECD and the IEA are pushing for governments to use the COVID-19 recovery efforts as an opportunity to phase out support for fossil fuels. And uh, we have seen a statement from the Secretary General of the OECD, and she has entreated that countries should seize this opportunity to reform subsidies and use public funds in a way that best benefit people and the planet and uh, should not only be focused on you know, economic recovery. So money spent supporting coal, oil, and gas should instead be invested in sustainable energy infrastructure, research and job training, especially in the current climate, and subsidies we see that more often than not, they drain resources that could, for example, strengthen health systems preparedness and resilience, for example. Uh, so an OECD report published on the 5th, June, uh, on 5th of June 2020 entitled Building Back Better, a Sustainable Resilient Recovery After COVID-19, examines ways in which governments can use stimulus measures to make investments and societal changes that can reduce the likelihood of future shocks and build resilient and environmentally sustainable societies. Um, so Forbes has also reported that the COVID-19 pandemic can lead the way for a new energy order, as Forbes is calling it, where the transition to low carbon future will start with a shift to investments in renewable and cleaner energies, including nuclear energy. Um, so how can we move towards sustainable development after the pandemic? So as we have seen, green investment in, is essential to ensure the security of the planet and to help create millions of jobs. And as has been stated by the Environment Minister of Costa Rica during the pandemic, restoring nature is not a burden to economic development. So a World Economic Report on the economic benefits of protecting nature claims that the COVID-19 pandemic has shown humanity that we are cap capable of making drastic changes to the way we do things. And the report also concludes that harnessing stimulus spending now to ensure that recoveries around the world are green and protect nature, biodiversity, and the climate would have a long-term payoff and cut future costs and risk. So this is, uh, on a positive note, already happening in countries such as Pakistan, Kenya, and South Korea, as well as Costa Rica. So where do we need changes? We need changes not only in the law, not only in the governance sector, but as an educator, as a lecturer, I think that the first thing that we need to change is the way we educate people. And there should also be a change in mindset. So if people are not educated about the need to shift the way that we behave as human beings in the uh, post COVID-19 new world order. So we will continue with our bad habits and these bad habits have contributed to harming the environment. So what is needed is not only a radical change in the way that we see governance, in the way that we see um, uh, the enforcement of laws, but also in the way that we educate our young minds uh, at the very beginning to uh, have a caring attitude towards nature. Um, so we have been talking a lot about flattening uh, the COVID-19 curve and uh, in the same vein, we should also be thinking about flattening the environmental curve. So um, the economist has written extensively on the nexus between uh, the environment and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and reminds us that both of them are connected and we need to flatten both curves to rebuild the world economy. So the harm from climate change will be slower than the harm that we have seen from this current pandemic, but it is projected that the harm will be more massive and longer lasting. So if there is a moment for leaders to show bravery and consensus in heading off that disaster, now is the time to shift the governance, to shift the way we do things. So our solutions and as a conclusion, um, I would support that uh, through the lens of policy, national and international law, international relations and diplomatic perspective, 
our policymakers and global leaders should pave the way in formulating in formulating innovative, adaptive, and effective legal and diplomatic global responses in implementing robust legislation and policy strategies uh, through models which will balance countries' pursuit of economic recovery with the implementation of the SDGs. So governments have to work hand in hand with the private sector because we always say that uh, you know governments have to do this have to do that but isn't it also the duty of the private sector and the civil society uh, to pave the way towards this new way of seeing things so so that we can prevent another crisis which is looming and which we know is the climate and environment crisis so what we need is behavioral change and systemic transformation so that we can hold this environmental crisis and this will be only possible through a change in the way we educate people and also a change in the mindset so as a concluding note uh, this pandemic has proven to be a tipping point in public consciousness and we can dare dream of a meaningful shift in environmental and climate policy and law in envisioning a green safe and healthy world for the current and future generations and this can be done if governments, if the private sector and civil society, they have the vision to do so, and they also take positive actions towards uh, this effort. So thank you very much. And if you have questions, I'm happy to take them afterwards. Thank you very much, Madam, for sharing your knowledge and the ideas related with the protection of environment. And ma'am, you have correctly said that it is not the responsibility of only the government, but it is the responsibility or the duty of the individual people or a society to take care of our government and to protect the environment. Thank you very much, ma'am. Now, the next key speaker of this international conference is Advocate Shadna Mahashabde, ma'am. Dr. Shadna Sunil Mahashabde is a practicing lawyer for 20 years she obtained her LLB degree and master degree from the University of Mumbai. She enrolled to Bar Council of Maharashtra and Goa in 1998. Further, she completed her PhD in environmental law from Bharti Vidyapeet in 2008. Ma'am is appointed as a senior counsel group one on the panel of central government since 6th April, 2010. Ma'am is senior counsel for the Maharashtra Pollution Control Board dealing with the matters on mill, land issues, municipal solid waste issues, eco-sensitive issues, Mahabaleshwar issues, hazardous and noise pollution issues, etc. in Supreme Court, High Court of Mumbai, and National Green Tribunal. She is also doing a charity work for the protection of children's rights. Ma'am received Rajiv Gandhi Pariyavaran Bhushan Puraskar in 2010 by the hands of Chief Maharashtra, uh, Chief Minister of Maharashtra in 2010 at the Government Environmental Day. Presently, Madam is a chairperson for Global Environment Solution NGO dedicated towards the environment protection. Ma'am is appointed as a notary by Government of India, Ministry of Law and Justice, Department of Legal Affairs, Notary Cell on 28-2-2019. Now I request the madam to address the gathering. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Jyoti, ma'am. And you. best wishes to environment cell. I'll uh, start with my presentation, the perspective of global governance of environment in pandemic era. Here, uh, I'll, uh, in this uh, seminar, I'll be mainly covering transboundary air pollution. <clears throat> Uh, I'll be skipping few of the points considering Krishni Madam has covered already and considering the time constraint. Uh, um, uh, I have divided my uh, presentation in nine chapters. First chapter I'm uh, discussing about transmission of the virus and spread of the pandemic. I'll go a little bit faster over here. Uh, introduction, modes of transmission of coronavirus from droplet to airborne spread of COVID-19 throughout the globe from Wuhan to various other countries, <clears throat> alarming statistics of the spread of the coronavirus, how the infections and the death rate 
went spiraling up around the globe and about the fair allocation of the vaccines strong global governance required for distribution of the vaccines to all the countries after this chapter uh, i will move to uh, chapter 2 that is improvement in air quality due to lockdown in this case also krishni madam uh, throw some light on the issues relating to the improvement in air quality due to lockdown uh, uh, i will uh, skip the introduction part uh, the improvement in air quality during lockdown the result of reduced human activity <clears throat> here i here i would like to put forth the major contributing factor of pollution are transport vehicle industries crop residue burning waste burning airplane emissions and so on and the suspension of these activities during lockdown lead to cleaner environment the next point is illustration of the improvement in air quality the increased visibility proves clear and clean air during the lockdown here i will point out the nasa has released some images which shows a reduction in the levels of the nitrogen oxide the nitrogen dioxide noxious gases emitted by the motor vehicles power plants industrial facilities as measured by the ozone monitoring instrument omi on nasa's aura satellite in march 2020 in usa and other parts of the globe so the uh, improvement in air quality is globally noted i'll move to chapter 3 uh, uh, as the world is facing uh, the issue of uh, uh, pandemic in the same time the economic crisis and its effects and the harsh realities of the lockdown are also taking place Mm. i will uh, move to the introduction amid the coronavirus pandemic several countries across the world resorted to lo lockdown to flatten the curve of the infection these lockdowns meant confining millions of citizens to their home shutting down businesses and ceasing almost all economic activities uh here uh, on the next point i would like to illustrate the economic crisis is going to hit various sectors and these sectors are large companies uh, across uh, various sectors media aviation retail hospitality automobiles have announced massive layoff in recent weeks the companies which were dependent on china for production have faced losses disparate migrant workers and daily wages laborers are fleeing cities unorganized sector uh, like street vendors hawkers and domestic maids have suffered the most the industries like tourism beauty wedding photography have hit a massive low and small and medium business are facing massive losses and the next point detrimental effects of lockdown and the resulting economic slowdown here i would like to point out uh, of uh, the 122 million who have lost their jobs and 91.3 millions were small traders and lab laborers but a fairly significant number of salaried workers that is 17.8 million and self employed people those are 18.2 millions have also lost their work high structural unemployment is likely to affect consumer confidence the economic crisis will induce inequality it will also cause mental health problems and lack of societal cohesion it is also likely to widen the wealth gap between young and old and to pose significant educational and employment challenges uh, i will uh, move for the chapter 4 that is relating to air pollution and covid the connection between the uh, air pollution and covid uh, as an introduction i would like to say air pollution reduces the immunity of the people and helps the transmission of the virus uh definition of air pollution as a second point um, 
ग्लोबल एयर डेफिनेशन एंड इंडियन एयर डेफिनेशन ग्लोबल डेफिनेशन इज एयर पोल्यूशन कैन बी डिफाइंड एज अ प्रेजेंस ऑफ अ टॉक्सिक केमिकल्स और कंपाउंड इंक्लूडिंग दोज बायोलॉजिकल ओरिजिन इन द एयर एट द लेवल दैट पोज हेल्थ रिस्क इट इज प्रेजेंस इन और इंट्रोडक्शन इन टू एयर ऑफ अ सब्सटेंस विच हैज हार्मफुल और पॉइजनस इफेक्ट डर्टी एयर इज preventing people of color in low income communities in particular from being able to have fighting chance against this pandemic these are the comments by a uh, gina mccarthy american environment health and air quality expert as far as the uh, indian uh, law that is a uh, air act 1981 which says air pollutant is defined as a solid liquid or gaseous substances including noise present in the atmosphere in such concentration as may be or tend to be injurious to human being or other living creatures or plants or property of environment and air pollution means the presence in the atmosphere of any air pollutant connection of covid-19 and air pollution third point i would like to comment one more link can be established between covid-19 and air pollution though considered of biological origin covid-19 is a harmful substance in air affecting humans and some animals thus covid-19 itself can be considered as a air pollutant i would like to move to chapter 4 that is transboundary nature of air pollution uh, here i would like to say as an introduction air pollution does not stop at national borders they cross the national borders and reach other countries uh, for the point transboundary air pollution meaning i will say transboundary flows of pollutants occur between the nations and its closest neighbors as well as between other countries continents the sources in the global commons such as international shipping and aviation uh, here i would like to illustrate few of the transboundary air pollution uh, example uh, mongolia world's most polluted country sandwiched between industrialized russia and china where easterly and westerly winds hurl smog from russia and china indonesia forest fires hurdle haze all over asian region in 1997 trade winds transfer the chinese south african and indian coal plants smog down to mongolia and botswana chinese smog goes to mongolia to iran and south african smog to botswana namibia and angola the next point transboundary nature of the covid i would like to say covid-19 originates in wuhan city of china it spread to a number of people in wuhan and gradually spread all over the globe through its human carriers thus covid-19 has a transboundary nature of spreading from one country to another though the infection originated in china all the countries all over the globe have faced the consequences i would like to move to chapter 6 that is existing global governance for transboundary air pollution and its use to combat covid-19 its drawbacks and reason for the failure this is the important chapter of my presentation uh, here i am discussing uh, existing global governance of transboundary air pollution are important because they enable countries to work together to address vital environmental issues that are transboundary or global in nature such as air pollution climate change protection of ozone layer and ocean pollution the first uh, convention i would like to discuss as a convention on long range transboundary air pollution uh, which is called as lrtap the attempt to effective international environmental cooperation since 1979 the convention on long range transboundary air pollution has addressed some of the major environmental problems unece 
region through uh, scientific collaboration and policy negotiations. Here, the UNECE is United, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. The convention has been extended by eight protocols that identify specific measures to be taken by parties to cut their emissions of air pollutants. The aim of conventions is that parties shall endeavor to limit and as far as possible gradually reduce the prevent air pollution and including long range transboundary air pollution. Parties develop policies and strategies to combat the discharge of air pollutants through exchange of information, consultation, research, and monitoring. I would like to uh, move to the uh, second uh, protocol, that is the UNEC's Convention on Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution, that is Gothenburg Protocol, the Multi Effect Protocol. The UNECE, the Convention on Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution, is a unique regional instrument to support a comprehensive approach. Its amended Gothenburg Protocol is in force since 2019, establishes legally binding emission reduction commitments for almost all major air pollutants and their groups for all economic sectors and emission sources. <clears throat> on, 4th Mo, uh, on 4th May 2012, at a meeting at the United Nations office at Geneva, the uh, parties of the Gothenburg Protocol agreed on a substantial number of uh, <clears throat> substantial uh, number uh, uh, of uh, revisions, most important are the inclusion of the commitments of parties to further reduce their emissions until 2020. These amendments now need to be ratified by parties in order to make them binding. As of August 2014, the protocol had been ratified by 26 countries, which include 25 states and the European Union as the 26th one. Here, uh, the next I would like to discuss the case law that is a particular matter and TAP in Pearl River Delta region of China. The Pearl River Delta region in southern China is one of the most developed region in China. This region continues to suffer from a high number of fine particulate matters that is PM 2.5 events and the result, uh, resultant public health impacts. Here I would like to point out the contribution of the pollution, 27% is of the local pollution and 73% is of the transboundary air pollution. The uh, fourth uh, uh, point I would like to uh, cover here as a United Nations Climate and Clean Air Collision, CCAC, that is a breathing space findings. <clears throat> now findings from a recent survey show that at least two third of citizens in five countries, including India, want stricter laws and enforcement to tackle the air pollution. When the COVID-19 crisis subsides, the UGO poll conducted in Bulgaria, Great Britain, India, Nigeria, Poland, and by clean air fund. The philanthropic initiative that aims to tackle air pollution around the world. The fund brings together researchers, policymakers, and campaigners to find and scale solutions for clean air launched in September 2019. It is also a partner of United Nations Climate and Clean Air Collision, that is CCAC. The findings of the poll were published and further discussed in the new briefing title, Breathing Space. The core idea behind the survey was to understand the levels of the awareness, concern about the air pollution among people, to understand their perceptions of relationship between air pollution and COVID-19. I will move to the uh, sixth point. Uh, 
which is the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development Cohesive Multilateral Response. <clears throat> The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development proposes uh, a more structural approach that is attentive to global inequalities as the world tackle this pandemic. In this, whatever it takes program, UNCAT ha has recently called for temporary debt standstills and for debtors right to invoke them unilaterally with independent panels sanctioning those requests. That means instead of creditors, together with the new debt relief programs that include features such as the waiving of interest payment. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, together with the High Commission of the Human Rights, Michael Bachelet, further demanded the easing of the unilateral sanctions financial and trade restrictions imposed on countries such as Venezuela, Iran, or Zimbabwe may inhibit them from obtaining some of the basic emergency relief funds that regional and multilateral agencies offer. As a sixth point, I would like to discuss a case law, which is a trail smelter dispute. This is the first arbitration over the air pollution dispute between two countries. Transboundary air pollution in North America was first formally addressed in 1949. A trail smelter arbitration, the US government claimed that Washington state residents and a property were negatively impacted by the sulfur dioxide blowing south from the Consolidated Mining and Smelting Company of Canada. Operating in trail, British Columbia, the US and the Canada formed an arbitration tribunal to establish cost for the damage caused in the US by the trail smelter, invoking the international principle of external responsibility. Under the principles of international law, as well as the law of the United States, no state has the right to use or permit the use of its territory in such a manner as to cause injury by fumes in or to the territory of another or the properties of the person therein. Prior to the decision made by the arbitral tribunal on trial, dispute over air pollution between two countries had never been settled through arbitration and the polluter pay principle had never been applied in an international context. The uh, seventh uh, point I would like to cover for the SARC framework to fight coronavirus. Southern Asian countries dealing with the unprecedented threat. Founded in 1985, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC, is a regional intergovernmental organization and geopolitical union of Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives and Nepal, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. SARC leaders also created a COVID-19 emergency fund made up of voluntary contributions from member states. It is imperative for the bloc to develop the normative framework and the institutional arrangements required to deal with the unprecedented threat posed by the outbreak of COVID-19. This development should expand on the existing international health framework created by the WHO 2015 International Health Regulations, a document created to outline how countries across the world can prevent and control of the spread of disease. Indeed, SARC should seize the opportunity to work together to plug the pre-existing gaps in these regulations. The Indian Prime Minister has called upon the region to use the SARC South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation Framework to fight coronavirus. We can follow this framework to solve what is essentially COVID in slow motion, that is air pollution. <clears throat> the eighth point I'll be covering other uh, uh, international agreements in 1998, the Government Council of the Southern Asia Cooperative Environment Program 
adopted a male declaration on control and prevention of air pollution and its likely transboundary effect on the south asia the asian the next is the asian agreement on the transboundary haze pollution signed in 2002 Japan, uh, the next is japan started air pollution measuring earth net program that is a uh, enet in east asia in 1992 korea started long range transboundary air pollution program lpt in north asian in 1995 so there are several programs uh, other international agreements are existing i'll move to the next and the last ninth point drawbacks or the reasons for failure why the international agreement failed to achieve their objectives the voluntary participation of the countries is one of the point the countries have an option to sign a treaty due to sovereignty of the country none of the Uh, global agencies can force a country to sign a treaty or a multilateral agreement the uh, next drawback point could be failure to cooperate at an international level international cooperation is the key to success of an international environmental agreement failure to cooperate creates unnecessary obstacles in the implementation of the legal principles the next drawback uh, uh, we could say is neighboring countries in dispute neighboring countries in dispute create problems for international cooperation next point i would like to take no data sharing and transparency uh, member countries most of the times are not transparent about their environmental data the re uh, their refusal to share the data or refusal to be transparent regarding <clears throat> their uh, information uh, causes uh, uh, is one of the reason uh, and the drawbacks uh, next point i would like to take is no internal mechanism to enforce treaty obligation the countries have no internal agencies that ensures the enforcement of a treaty obligations and the these obligations are neglected by the states the member countries does have no mandate to follow certain environmental principles uh, the next point uh, i would like to point out is poor implementation by global agencies the global agencies have failed to impose certain treaty obligations on the member countries the countries have to be answerable to the global agencies and the penalty has to be imposed in case of violation of a principle by a member country uh, i would like to move after this important sixth chapter uh, which which was dealing with the existing global governance for transboundary air pollution i will move to next chapter that is chapter 7 importance of global and multilateral efforts of uh, to combat covid 19 uh as an introduction i would like to say covid 19 is an ex is ex existential threat that has unended global system has upended global system and without international cooperation both the exit from the crisis and recovery is likely to be slow and weak scaling up of a medical capacity for treatment and testing here i would like to say mobilizing health professional is at the core of the fight against covid 19 however it is also critical that these professionals are equipped with sufficient medical supplies whatever for effective and safe patient care government should cooperate to preserve trade openness while scaling up global medical testing capacity enabling access to vital medical goods at affordable prices <clears throat> yet the global supply of medical goods has failed to meet the increased demand prompting countries to reduce exports and favors domestic use the export restrictions on vital goods can hinder global health efforts by delaying trade <clears throat> the next point i would like to cover effective vaccine development and 
deployment which is in the most uh, discussion globally government will have to spend 10 to 100 of billions to vaccinate every person on the planet although this cost fails in co comparison to the number of lives the vaccine could save the price tag can be reduced significantly and the vaccination accelerated if government cooperation to avoid a bidding war that could drive up prices. Multilateral uh, fundraising efforts for the vaccine are already underway, such as the coronavirus global response pledging event that raised uh, 7.4 billion euro for universal vaccine access. These efforts could be supported and bolstered. Governments also need to agree upfront on rules for international uh, property rights and procurement and impose universal standard of evidence for vaccine approval. Finally, an international commitment to a fair allocation system to ensure that the vaccine will be widely available and that the countries that need it most are not deprived would be welcome. Such a system could rely on existing instruments and institutions and prioritize delivery of vaccines to the healthcare workers and high risk population. Simultaneous support to the strengthen the delivery capacities of developing countries is also critical for vaccine access for the vulnerable population. I will move to the next chapter uh, that is suggestive improvements in the multilateral system for good global governance. As an introduction, I would say air pollution routinely kills millions each year. It contributed to more than 5 million deaths or up to 22% of all the deaths in the South Asia in 2012. Furthermore, if COVID-19 becomes established or without a vaccine or cure, the air pollution will increase the death rate in the any outbreak. The existing multilateral system has to be upgraded to deal with such and uh, future cross-country air pollution and pandemic. I will deal with uh, next point, suggestive improvements in global governance. In this, regional and international cooperation, data sharing, revive existing multilateral agreements, constructive stance by the governments, increased understanding amongst scholars, diplomats and politicians, and international agreements should possess authoritative structure of domestic law. So uh, in, in these areas, uh, if the global governance need to be improved, I would like to uh, give some suggestions to improving existing framework in SARC countries. All SARC member states have recognized the urgency of regional cooperation and agreed that they must prepare, act and succeed together to fight the spread of pandemic in the region. For SARC countries, to build on this commitment to work together during this crisis, it is imperative to develop the normative framework and institutional arrangements required to deal with the unprecedented uh, threat posed by the outbreak of COVID-19. This development should expand on the existing international health framework created by the WHO. <clears throat> The world can prevent and control uh, of uh, the measures taken uh, can be implemented by SARC and SARC should seize the opportunity to work together to plug the pre-existing gaps in this regulation. Now I will uh, go for uh, my last uh, chapter that is a conclusion. I will move for the uh, conclusion. COVID-19 and air pollution, uh, uh, I would like to say the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic is a defining global health crisis of our time and the greatest challenge we have faced since World War II. 
since its emergence in asian late last year the various uh, the virus has spread to every continent except antarctica as far as the covid-19 and air pollution is concerned lockdown have given us cleaner skies but covid-19 has spread more in the areas with a higher air pollution covid-19 also has a transboundary nature like air pollution and thus it has to be tackled by international cooperation covid-19 and economy here i would like to say here i would like to conclude like the pandemic is much more than the uh, health crisis it's also an pre precedented socio economic crisis stressing every one of the countries it touches it has the potential to create devastating social economic and uh, political effects that will leave deep and long lasting scars uh, as far as the existing uh, international agreements i would like to conclude numerous international agreements exist to tackle transboundary air pollution these agreements can be used to deal with coronavirus in the same way they deal with cross country air pollution however there is no ideal enforcement of these agreement by the member states these international agreements have some drawbacks amending and updating this existing multilateral structure to deal with the challenges of coronavirus will be lot easier than creating a new framework to deal with it <clears throat> fragmented efforts will not work <clears throat> in this aspect i would like to cover coronavirus has spread rapidly all over the globe developing countries are grappling with this additional problem along with their problems like poverty overpopulation and inadequate health facilities the international cooperation is required if we want to eradicate covid-19 and get back to the normalcy i would like to conclude for the next point that is a strong global governance strong global governance will ensure the control of the spread of the coronavirus it will also ensure the availability of the vaccines and medicines to the developing countries the global governance has to ensure that the vaccines are allocated fairly and economically to each and every country uh as last i would like to conclude overall uh, like uh, global challenges need global solutions fragmented and individual efforts will not suffice for the pandemic of the century regional and international cooperation and strong global governance is required to tackle the spread of the covid-19 and the resultant economic debacle the existing multilateral agreements can be the best to put to use by upgrading them to suit the challenges of covid-19 uh, covid-19 can be treated as a transboundary air pollution and the multilateral agreements to deal with the transboundary air pollution can be amended and given more power and proper implementation the countries have to be transparent while sharing their environmental data the global governance has to ensure fair allocation of vaccines and medicines to all the countries thank you for patient hearing thank you ma'am for those words of wisdom and for imparting such prolific learnings to our attendees now i would like to introduce our next keynote speaker for the day Mr Nasser Ali Abdullah sir Mr Nasser Ali did his masters from Bharatiya Vidyapeet University in environment science he is a graduate in agriculture from Duhok University from Kurdistan Iraq alongside he completed his diploma in mass media and political science from Pune University he has taken keen interest in research and publications he has more than 10000 news and stories published in his name in rundo and in and in newspaper of iraq india he is presently working as assistant professor in duhok university and he is also the officer manager in duhok network media duhok city now i would request mr nasser ali sir to address the attendees sir please
Uh, hello, good morning. Can you hear me, everyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're already able to start. Yes. Sir. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry because uh, that times uh, they 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 have problem something from my computer. I think so. Uh, now I'm Nasr Ali. Uh, now I'm uh, staying in Duhok, uh, Kurdistan, Iraqi. So uh, I was in India uh, in 2011 to 2013. So uh, now I will um, I will. Uh, thinking about some important, maybe uh, it, it will be uh, very. It will be a difference in in another other thing. So because uh, my experience as a journalist about the uh, seventeen years, I'm working as a journalist also uh, as well as uh, I I had completed in uh, environment science in um, uh, in India. So uh, my um, seminar or. Uh, now I will uh, discuss something about the role of media to protect the environment in both ISIS wars and COVID-19 uh, times in Iraqi Kurdistan. And I will uh, I will talking about something in in Iraqi uh, Kurdistan in Kurdistan and also in in all Iraq. If we're talking about the uh, Kurdistan or Iraq, so uh, maybe so, so many countries or so many people, they were thinking about the war in Iraq and they killed the people, something like this. But uh, uh, my focus is because of uh, uh, my, my, my experience or that my information about the uh, effect of the environment. So uh, in, in, I will talking about the that war, what they will happen in Iraq, uh, still now, how the effect of the, uh, the, 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 the environment. If we talking about the Iraq uh, in um, 2000, uh, in 1951, uh, started the war in Iraq. After that, the not complete, still now maybe uh, it is continue. Uh, so, if we're talking about the period of the uh, ISIS, what happened in Iraq um, or in Syria, because in the in, in ISIS war, it started in 2000, uh, in 2014, still 2017, maybe uh, many people they know, uh, ISIS in 2017 completed or uh, they, they people in Iraq or the uh, all the world, they will go that um, uh, solve the ISIS war in, in Iraq, but still now it's continue the uh, ISIS war in Iraq. Uh, so many people, uh, they were thinking about the uh, may, maybe humanity and uh, uh, kill the people and everything. So they, will, uh, talk, they were talking on the policy of Iraq in the world and how they affected ISIS war in the economic or in the policy in this area or in the world. But my focus is now I will talking about the affected ISIS wars in the environment in this area. Uh, if we uh, affected ISIS wars in the in, uh, environment, Iraqi's environment has been subjected to other number of the uh, converging uh, process stemming from uh, pollution growth, the impact of uh, three wars uh, worse claim climate change for land uh, using planning and uh, encouragement uh, for ecosystem. Iraqi force serious environment problems uh, ranging from the poor uh, water quality, uh, soil salinity, air pollution, and conflict pollution to the uh, deterioration of a Q ecosystem, uh, climate change impacted on the three of the water stored. Uh, if it, uh, ISIS wars in the environment, if we're talking about the climate change uh, or that not just the, the, this war, if we're talking about before the, between 1970 uh, uh, and uh, 2019, Iraqi annual means a temperature increased by the one uh, to two uh, degree in the uh, prospectus uh, propagation in Iraqi is limited and the majority of the country is arrayed to uh, simulate. There have been 
Voilable change it in annual uh, rain for the uh, period 1951 to uh, 2000. Uh, with the both increased north uh, uh, north and the northeast of Iraq and uh, decreases south east and uh, south east and uh, west Iraq. Uh, Humidad uh, 2080 found its significant written excrepated over Iraqi during the period and the uh, 1991 to still 2019, and uh, identified two significant duration period in of uh, 1998 uh, 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 still the 2017 uh, to 2018. Duration has become more intense at the uh, central and the southwestern part of Iraq. They more frequency, but short uh, duration has been explored. Broadline uh, duration has been taken uh, to rain feed crops in the north of Iraq. Uh, water, if we're talking about the water resource, water demand in, increased in Iraq due to uh, population growth, environmental uh, considerations, and uh, 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 economic development. Iraqi is very de uh, dependent on the uh, Safari water, Tiger, and the uh, Euratis rivers, crossing its uh, borders from the neighboring continents. All uh, Bissan uh, countries, Iran and Iraq and Syria and Turkey, uh, have developed large scale projected, uh, most even antelated with the uh, concentration with the uh, airports. So all, all things they will affect it of the uh, water resource. If we are talking about the biodiversity loss, there has uh, been uh, severe uh, durations of uh, Iraqis biodiversity due to uh, 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 and the number of factors including uh, unregulated wanting of the uh, uh, harvesting of uh, species rather of the adjacent species. Conflict pollution, this thing, it's most important that uh, what happened in, in, in Iraqi and the uh, effect of the environment. Provide conflict have left it Iraq with the uh, legacy, or, uh, legacy of the environment pollution and uh, undermined uh, uh, the government's ability of the effectivity monitorate and the uh, monk uh, uh, condominium societies. Iraqi has its uh, periods with uh, trans distribution in uh, per structure from systemic and extended subsidies by the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria in uh, 2014 to uh, 2017, as well as from the military operation uh, to uh, recuperation uh, their areas, uh, key issue including uh, pollution problems from the uh, co coerced oil uh, fires and the uh, mushroom sulfur plants, air quality and the pollution risk from oil uh, fires and the artisanal oil security expanding risk from the damaged uh, uh, ISIS ammunition factoring plant, uh, visiting quality of uh, the Paris and the Westerian. Uh, so, okay, climate change noted in Iraq, including 2004, increased in my annual temperature sinus in 1950 uh, at the rate of the uh, uh, appraisal of the uh, 0.7 per century. Uh, variably change in annual rainfall for the period in uh, 1951 to and uh, 2019. In the Northwest, the most uh, um, uh, moderation climate annual rainfall has increased at the rate of uh, 2.5 uh, monthly percentages. In the Southwest and similar steep climate, uh, annual rainfall has 
decreased at the rate of uh, 0.88 uh, most per uh, uh, center. Uh, in the west and right climate, annual rainfall has uh, decreased at the rate uh, of 5.93, uh, mostly per centers. If we're talking about the ice water of the, uh, 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 in, in here, uh, that times uh, uh, wars started from the 2000. 14 to 2017. War in Iraq, both of Iraq and Syria. Uh, war reminding the number of Baltics used in the war is uh, about two tri tri trillion shots. So many difference of that uh, using in the in the war in both that country, Iraq and Syria. Still now, is it affected of the environment? Both of them in the soil and uh, air pollution and uh, uh, ground waters also in the uh, both each country. Uh, it is uh, 2020, but now um, uh, 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 about uh, during the uh, GIZ, the Germany uh, uh, or, uh, organization, they were working in Iraq. Uh, there are the uh, five city of Iraq, they have problem with the groundwater pollution because of that, uh, what happened in Iraq and the, 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 during the 2014 to 2017, the war is happening in Iraq, and as well as the, it, it used in this war, the war, war, the ISIS war in, in Iraq and Syria, three times as uh, toxic in all of Iraqi and Syria. All of this, that thing, they were affected of the uh, pollution, uh, both of them, the water and soil and the uh, groundwater and the air pollution. So um, I will talking uh, some, some data about the, uh, that work that will happen in, in, in here. Uh, killed more than 2,000 people, killed uh, uh, bodies, taken bodies of the soil, affected on the, on the soil and water and the air pollution because uh, maybe the religion in here, there's a difference to the other country if we're talking about the India and other country. The body in here, in uh, our country, uh, they, they uh, Muslim country, most of them, um, take it of the soil. So uh, uh, the, the, that people, they were was, they was killing, uh, kill it in, in this world, uh, not that inside of the soil, but of the take it of the uh, up of soil, all of the, all of them, they there was a problem of the uh, air pollution. Then the effect of the uh, soil also. About also uh, it's about uh, ten thousand uh, dunam of air was fired because of the ISIS war in both of them. Uh, this area, if I'm uh, now I'm in Dohuk, if you're talking about the Dohuk city and Erbil city and Kirkuk and Mosul, then the uh, some uh, th three uh, city of if Iraq and also uh, in Syria, so many places, all of you they will affected of the uh, air pollution, then affected of the biodiversity of the of that area because uh, killed more than uh, 1500 animals, different types of animal killed in, the, uh, in that area because of the fire and the fighting and the uh, clay. All that animals, they were, they were affecting of the uh, environment of this area. Uh, it's my focus now, I'm talking about the media, how the role of media of that area. Because of my experience the, the, and the, my, my project, that, the role of media to protection environment, and also I was taken uh, Indian and the Kurdistan. This is my uh, that times uh, I am I'm taking the three newspaper in India and uh, three, three newspaper in in here in in Iraq in in Kurdistan. Uh, that uh, three newspaper uh, the Times of India and the Sakali Time and uh, Doni the the. Uh, as I, I take the data from that th three newspaper that times uh, in 2011 to 2013, 
and also I'm taking data from the uh, three newspaper in here in uh, Iraqi on Iraq Kurdistan. So that times I'm talking about the 2013, uh, the, 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 the media, I'm talking about the media of the India, uh, around, um, uh, around 80 percentage of the media just cover it, the information about the environment. Other thing, is it very uh, 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 given the information about the environment and the how affected the environment on thing but in here in kurdistan that times just 15 percentage uh, talking the um, uh, article and news and the report everything program about the uh, uh, environment and effect of environment and everything if they so during in that uh, uh, ISIS war what happened in here we talking some uh, we we give uh, we we explain it some uh, uh, some data about that area uh, maybe so many people policy of the world is of the, the, the many countries, they will thinking about the, how the uh, effect of that war in the uh, humanity and the economic, uh, the policy of this is here. But many uh, media and many uh, reporters and many things, they will talking about that war, they will happen it in here, how affected of the, uh, of the environment. You know, if you're talking about the Halabcha city, in, it's one city of Kurdistan. In uh, 1988, uh, there was uh, 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 there, there there was uh, Saddam Hussein in here. They were scale, uh, they, they they bombing a Kimya bombing of that area, and killed than five thousand people that times. But still now, the effect of the, uh, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the people of there, because of the uh, soil pollution and the groundwater pollution and the, uh, also the, that uh, plant, they will uh, grow of that area. The people, they, they, they eat it of that growth. So affected of the, uh, the, the, the health of the people, uh, exactly uh, during the report of the uh, one uh, organization in here, uh, in 2019, one report, they will uh, say uh, 2.5 uh, girls, uh, the women on, in that city, affected of the child because of the bombing. I'm talking how much difference in 1988, there, there was happened bombing of that halab chesty. Still now, is it affected of the people? So how the, 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 that war in that, that there was happening if, if Iraq maybe still now is it continuous some places, but uh, nobody in the wars, they were thinking about how that war effect, war affected of the environment. So it's many um, uh, uh, affected of them. Uh, I'm talking about the, our um, newspaper or the Rodao network because that uh, I'm uh, around uh, 15, uh, 12 years, I'm working of that uh, network uh, media. Uh, we we thinking, and also we did some many different report about that, uh, uh, that uh, effect of the environment, but it's very less because why? Uh, because not all that uh, the, they are working of the policy of that network media, uh, Roda, uh, thinking about same me, because all of you may be thinking about the economic and other policy and other thing. But if we are talking about the, in the role of media to, uh, to, to, develop, uh, to, to uh, protect the environment of this area, it's very less. I'm not just talking uh, uh, my, my opinion, but uh, we have um, uh, government in here, the uh, Minister of the Environment, uh, before uh, three months, it's taking the uh, plan and the uh, data they give us, just as it 30% uh, of Iraqi media and all of them, the TV news and the uh, social, social media, they was talking about just the media, just uh, the, the uh, sorry, the uh, environment and all of 30 percentage. But that thing, what they was 
say about the environment just the uh, little news and the uh, small news and the something little about there and about the uh, 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 the, uh, the the report and the how uh, taking the data from that environment is very less i'm uh, suggested that in the all the media in the world and the uh, in this area exactly, they will uh, more focus it on that thing, what what will be saying about the affected uh, ISIS war in the environment in this area, uh, be because of still now they will affect it of them. Uh, it is uh, uh, something happened in, in the uh, ISIS war in, in both uh, picture, if you will see, one of them is that uh, Mosul city may uh, use so. So what happened there? So many uh, things happened there and the uh, 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 building and uh, construction and uh, uh, everything. Thing. And also uh, it show uh, how the uh, ISIS world affected of the uh, uh, air pollution. And if you're talking about the, uh, the, the um, manuary uh, 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 mines of, of in, in, in here. During this time, there was uh, five, uh, four million means it's uh, remained in the different area in uh, uh, ISIS uh, wars in, in both of them, uh, Iraqi, Kurdistan, and the Syrian. Still now, so many people, they will kill it of them about the kill, but how uh, that um, means affected of the environment, both of them is a soil uh, pollution, then the uh, people, they can't go there, that area, uh, they will uh, uh, develop in and uh, uh, the plant there. And uh, also they will affect it of the uh, oil pollution. And uh, if you uh, uh, explain it about that uh, material, they will make it there uh, of all the means. Uh, all the all all things they will affect it of the uh, soil pollution, air pollution, and still also uh, groundwater in inside of the uh, soil because of the of all that means uh, they will uh, uh, making in uh, ISIS military in there in Iraqi and in Syria and some of them they taken from the other country but uh, never thinking about how affected of the environment of this area. Still now, so many area in the Shangal, Isidian people there, uh, and the uh, um, Syrian, they people, the people can't go that area. They will uh, fighting their uh, uh, ISIS fighting there because of that means. And uh, so many effects of the uh, plant there and the development of uh, 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 planting. If you're talking about the uh, Mosul city, it's one uh, city of that happened uh, war in, in there, Iraq, it's Iraqi city in uh, near of the Duhok, my city there. So not just the means, if you're talking about the, uh, the, the concentration or that what happened there, you know, um, around, uh, around uh, uh, 500 uh, five, uh, 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 500,000 uh, building, they will uh, uh, cross it because of that firing. Oh, so whole, all that thing, they, they, they still now not investigated what happened there and what's inside of there and uh, how many people killed inside of there. And also how the effect of the environment in this area and uh, uh, and if we clean in this area and to bring to outside and to other places, uh, how many years they will remain in there in the, in the soil and in the water. Uh, and also uh, maybe time is not so much good for to, to, uh, to me, but I'm uh, just two minutes. I will talking about the, uh, COVID-19, uh, 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 how, how affected of the uh, uh, environment in this area. I'm talking about the Kurdistan because a benefit of uh, curfew of the uh, protection environment in Iraqi Kurdistan, because it's more important, maybe the difference to the, my uh, topic, but uh, it's something very important there. If we see that picture, it's a two picture, different uh, different years. 
Uh, one of them uh, uh, in uh, 2020 and the other uh, 2019. So as a very difference, how many car they were working in there. Uh, I'm talking about not uh, about the Iraq. I'm just if we are talking about the uh, Kurdistan uh, as it, my city, my, uh, Kurdistan is three uh, city, Ira, uh, Duhok and uh, Arbil and Hawle. There, were, uh, there are um, uh, around uh, 1 million uh, uh, and 2,100 cars they have there. And during of that uh, uh, period of the uh, 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 court view in Iraq, just using 200, uh, 200,000 cars if there. Other words, they will stop it because of the uh, cover view. All of you, they will affect it of the air pollution because all that car daily they go to out and they they using of uh, gases and uh, 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 increase the uh, uh, um, uh, um, so CO2 in the in the oil and affect uh, the air and uh, uh, release it to, uh, related to the uh, uh, air pollution there. So uh, that, that, that I'm taking about that, my experience there because of uh, uh, my, uh, uh, I, I know about that, uh, how effective of the environment, uh, the number of the car used daily in Kurdistan before Corona, uh, 1.2, uh, uh, see, 1,200,000 cars, they using and daily in that street city just uh, around we have uh, six million uh, population of that area uh, we have uh, one million two hundred thousand cars they they using daily uh, before the uh, COVID nineteen uh, nineteen times and in inside of the COVID nineteen uh, uh, just they using two uh, two hundred thousand cars use it daily in this area. So how that affected of the, uh, so uh, solve that problem. But is it just that uh, very less times, maybe after that, they will uh, uh, they will also use it so many car there and everything. Not just the car, maybe uh, manufacture uh, in Kurdistan, there are, there, there are uh, around uh, uh, 2,000 manufacturer in, in all that city. Uh, during of the uh, Corona, uh, just the uh, use, uh, the, just the uh, working uh, 100 manufacturer there, all other manufacturer, they does not use uh, working in that times. All of them, they will affect it of the, uh, uh, poly, uh, poly, uh, of, the of the environment uh, the, the increase, uh, the, the, uh, the decreases of the air pollution and uh, everything what is uh, happening there in Iraqi. Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving me the, uh, that times and also participated of this confer conference. Also, I hope as a, you give a, I will give you some information about the, that area and that uh, what happened in ISIS war and after that, uh, uh, COVID-19 times in this area. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for sharing the on-ground reality of Iraq and for incubating your valuable knowledge on role of media with us. Now, I would like to introduce our next keynote speaker for the day, Miss Minnie Jan Ma'am. Miss Minnie Ma'am, is skillful in bringing unlikely combination of people together in order to bring about the action needed to enable changes in complex system. Ma'am initiates and connect to grassroots level movements in India, the country where she belongs from and in UK where she lives now. Using all her abilities, her motivation is to enable voice of the poorest of the poor, the richest of the rich, the marginalized, the disposed to retain human dignity and simplicity in their lives. Ma'am is director of Flow Partnership, a trustee of the Agro Forestry Research Trust, an editor of the Holistic Science Journal, and a board member for the Barkana Institute. Now I would request Ma'am to please address the attendees. Ma'am, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for your invitation to speak at this uh, conference that you've organized, uh, discussing a very pertinent and very 
uh, topical issue at the moment. And all our speakers yesterday and today have touched upon uh, the, 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 the environmental uh, laws and the, what is currently happening that we need to do to ensure that we get out of the mess that we're, we're at the moment in. Uh, I also want to say that uh, I have lived in Pune before and I have been to Bharti Vidyapeet before. So it's, it's a real joy and pleasure to be part of your group uh, this morning. Uh, it's morning here in the UK where I'm living. Um, so um, what I would like to start about, first of all, I want to reference something that Dr. Shiva said this morning and uh, which is so pertinent that we are destroying nature's home. And in the destruction of nature's home is how a pandemic has reached us. So it's not the first time a pandemic is reaching us or these illnesses that uh, come to human beings after destroying nature's home. So that's a really key sentence. If you keep that in mind, uh, you think, what is behind that? What is it that keeps the balance between nature and uh, humans? There is, in my mind, I feel that there is a whole a law uh, that nature has, a nature's law, as I call them, and my colleague Philip Francis yesterday referred to it, uh, uh, to also water, water law. That is an absolute, you know, nature has its laws and through those laws, we have a really healthy uh, environment that we can live in. Uh, it's not as if those laws uh, uh, are something that we can negotiate with or we can have out of court settlements if we break them. They are the laws which give us the right environment in which to live. Now, man, mankind often forgets that. And we think that we are supreme and human beings, everything is so anthropocentric. Human beings create the laws and in those laws, uh, we will be able to live healthy and happy lives. Um, that's such a false belief. You, you take, I mean, and, uh, um, this morning, one of the speakers was talking about air pollution has no boundaries. So uh, take, take, I'll give you an example. Take that same air pollution, okay? If, if we violate nature's laws and man makes a law that says, okay, I'm gonna set up this factory over here and let it pollute uh, air, you know, the air around here. And even if it crosses borders, it doesn't matter. And it'll pollute it a little and all the human beings in this area will get sick a little, but I can live with this little bit of sickness. Is that the right law? Are we making the right laws? Our laws should be in harmony with what nature's laws are. Only then can we continue to have a habitable planet for all life on earth, not just human beings. So echoing nature's law is what man's laws should be. That's, that's the fundamental uh, premise that we should keep in mind when we create our laws. Now, often when you hear the word law, you tend to think of courts and you think of fighting and you think, of, but there is also the other side of these laws is when we make these laws, how can we make them in harmony uh, um, you know, together with different human beings, different perspectives, can we make them in harmony with nature? So for that, I thought that I would uh, take you, give you a story from Europe, which is where I now live. I live in the UK, which is still part of the European Union. And uh, there are 28 states in the European Union, um, at least till the end of this year. EU, the UK is going to leave the European Union at the end of uh, December 2020, and it's going to become 27 states. Um, so let me show you a story from the European Union, uh, which gi gives you a lot of hope that yes, man can work in harmony with nature. I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, here we go. Can everybody see my screen? Um, yes. So um, in the year 2000, now the, this is a story about water. Water is the work we do. My work is in water, managing floods and droughts with communities. And yesterday you had uh, seen what Philip had showed about the Global Water Bank and how we try and create a credit uh, in the Global Water Bank with local communities using traditional techniques and wisdom. And how can we transpose that into something that uh, works for the global community? So, uh, I came across, uh, you know, this is a map of Europe. You can see how many countries there are. I mean, uh, if you have three people in a room, they don't agree, but can you imagine heads of states of 28 countries sitting and agreeing on something? Is that possible? <laughs> and I say, yes, it's possible. And they did it. I mean, they've done it many times, but this is one example which I can give you. 
uh, they came up in the year 2000, uh, a, natu a law which was working in harmony with natural law uh, for clean rivers in Europe, which would have drinking water quality. Okay, And they called that the Water Framework Directive. That came about in the year 2000 with the idea that they would manage Europe's waters on a river basin scale. Now that was revolutionary. Managing the Europe's waters on a river basin scale uh, it's a, it, it's not a small job. I mean, the rivers run across many boundaries. It's a transboundary issue. Many countries, many different cultures, many different heads of states, many different laws. How do you get them to align? Uh, and yet they did. They sat down together. They created a, a, a set of directives. And of the, there are about 53 points in which, and here are my favorite ones. And the first one to me was the most uh, crucial, it, in which they enshrined in law that water is not a commercial product like any other, but rather a heritage which must be protected, defended, and treated as such. I, you can even use the word, uh, you know, because this was the water framework directive, you, they use the word water, but you can use the word nature instead of water. You know, that nature is not a commercial product. It's, it's a heritage which we live healthy lives with it, must be protected, defended, and treated as such. The next one that came uh, out to me in their Water Framework Directive, which I thought was very interesting, there, I, I, as you can see, this is number 18. It said the community should provide common principles and the overall framework for action. So it's not a bunch of people sitting in a room somewhere, you know, uh, far away from where the issues are and actually hammering out something and imposing it on the people. It is a consultation. It is coming out from people, the community, that is the whole European community of the different peoples and their different uh, viewpoints and their laws and their cultures and their understanding of water, that they should provide a common set of principles and an overall framework for action. So it was by consensus. So the, it was not one set of uh, people imposing a rule on the other because nature is transboundary. Water is transboundary. The impact of what we do with water in one nation affects the other. So keeping that principle in mind was crucial. Then they came up with the other one, that it should be for the whole river basin district. What a revolutionary thought that you administer, you administrate, you look after the river as a whole river basin, not as li different little parts of different countries. So can you imagine if they, what we do in certain countries is that this bit of the river belongs to uh, this country, X country, this bit of the river belongs to Y country. And so uh, X will take certain uh, actions, Y will take other actions. They may or may not be in harmony, what a mess. Instead, if you look at the whole river as an entity, which it is, and you look after the whole entity in its river basin, then you are actually, you've got a revolution, you've got a visionary holistic way of looking at how we manage and look after the water so it can look after us. Um, and the, the, uh, another point which really, really feel, I felt was uh, important, which they enshrined in law, was the involvement of the general public before final decisions on the necessary measures are adopted. So we're not voiceless. We, the general public, are not voiceless in this uh, directive. We have had a say. Uh, you know, we were allowed to give our viewpoint. So it's not somebody speaking for us, but we are allowed to give our viewpoint. And they took that into account before they created the, the entire, the, the water framework directive. So uh, just to show you how difficult that task might have been, look at this. There are hundreds of rivers in Europe, if you can see. That's a map of Europe. Those are the big rivers. But if you scroll down, I've just put this in for you to have a look. Look at this. There are, these are rivers by length and they're long rivers. They're like 700, 600, 800 miles. A thousand miles, etc. This goes on and on and on. This is about a hundred rivers. And then the water bodies, because the water framework directive, it established a framework for protecting of all waters, the rivers, the lakes, the coastal waters, the groundwaters, about 110,000 uh, 110, water bodies and counting. So to set up a directive that covers all that, the management of that through different countries, looking at what is the right thing to do, in harmony with natural law uh, was not a mean feat. And yet they did it. And they set up a, this system of management within river basins that water systems do not stop at political borders. 
It requires cross-border cooperation between countries and all involved parties. It ensures active participation of all stakeholders in water management. And it, to me, I'm going to pause here for a minute. Look at that. It involves active participation of all stakeholders. What is currently happening is uh, as, a, as, as a group of humans, we have a set of humans making laws for us or giving us what we should do. And in that we have abdicated our own responsibility of participating in those decisions. So it's a two way process. It's not just that people, you know, our governments make laws for us, but it's also us. We have to make our voice heard. The less we make our voice heard in creating the right laws, then the less those laws represent us. So that was a crucial point. It ensures active participation of all stakeholders in water management activities. And it ensures reduction uh, control of pollution from sources like agriculture, industrial activity, urban areas. It requires, and it requires water pricing policies that ensures that the polluter pays. Why should I pay? I'm not polluting, I don't want to pay. But if there's this huge, uh, you, you look at the case of the Ganges, you, how much effluent is being pumped into the Ganges, poisoning the waters, and do those polluters pay? Instead, it is the common people who live on the banks of the Ganges who are paying by A, bathing in that dirty water, and uh, B, um, 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 getting sick and all the other things that come, come out of violating that natural law which gave us the clean Ganges in the first place. So it balances the interests of the environment with those who depend on it. Now, look at those, that phrase, those who depend on it. Uh, is it a set of people? Is it a group of people? Is it all of us? Is it all of nature? It is, it's all of nature, not just a little bit, a few humans here and there. So keeping in mind that all of nature depends on the environment was enshrined in law. And this was a revolution, it's law. It was created as a really revolutionary piece of legal framework that could be achieved. And the overall aim was, of course, because it was a water framework directive, to achieve good water status for all waters by 2015. So that was the framework. That was the background of how the framework was put into place. Okay. So the, then the question comes, and that was the year 2000, so not that far back in memory. And uh, most of you, uh, you would have been young uh, uh, from the student body, you would have been fairly young, but however, it's in living memory. So then the question comes, uh, 2000 came, 2015 came, did the framework and the water framework directive, did it work? Did it achieve its purpose? So they did a fitness test and they called it the fitness test in 2018. They had a public consultation. The feedback period was from 17th of September till 12th of March. And so it was a fairly long time. And again, what was really good was that the consultation gathered views from the public on their understanding and relation with water. So it wasn't as if the public was kept aside and only the national authorities, experts and private entities in charge of implementation were giving. It was everybody, the views from the public was sought. And the feedback was intended to go beyond pure implementation. It was to collect uh, opinions and to see how it could be improved further. So that happened between 17th September and 12th of March. And then on the 13th of March, 370,000 plus people, they called on the European Commission that no matter where we are, Europe's water law is very strong. And that for all the reasons I mentioned above, okay? And it is one of the largest uh, public consultations which had produced that law. And this consultation to see whether it was fit or not was another large consultation which said, that this law is critical to ensure Europe's rivers, lakes, and wetlands are protected and brought back to good health. So hands off our water law was what the citizens told the European Commission. Do not uh, uh, you know, tinker with it to change it. The law itself is very good. What has happened is that the implementation of it needs to be uh, uh, done more properly. Hmm? So, in March 2020, the re report of that consultation was re released, and they found that roughly 47% of the EU water bodies failed to achieve the aims of the Water Framework Directive. So that's a really shocking figure, and you think, oh my God, 47% failed. But there are 53% that sort of made it. So look at the other side, that as human beings, we can try. We, we must keep 
trying to achieve what the final goal is. Don't look at the failures, look at the successes and build on them. So on the one hand, you know, the things that come out is that the Water Framework Directive was successful in setting up a governance framework for looking after more than 110,000 water bodies, you know, and slowing down deterioration of the water status, reducing chemical pollution, uh, making, helping it become cleaner, drinkable. But then the other thing they found is, of course, substantial progress was not made. And uh, the implementation was de delayed le and less than half the water bodies are in good status, okay? Even though the deadline was this. So we, one is that we've got the good law. The two is that we haven't been that fast in implementing it. So we need to then move further. And I think that was the message that the, the 370,000 people said, okay, we'll try harder. You know, but don't change the law. The law is an echoing a harmony with natural law and the law is really good. So can we make laws like that? From the Water Framework Directive, some things that I felt uh, that we cannot miss was that it was created and written into law. It wasn't just a set of aspirations. It was proper environmental legal law, all of which echoed a natural, the nature's law. So. It wasn't just an aspiration alone, it was law, which means it could be enforced by uh, legal frameworks of all the countries that participated in it. It was on good water management principles or water law, as my colleague said. It fostered transnational cooperation through sustainability and through confidence building and conflict prevention. What an amazing law. You know, nowadays, all you hear about is conflict between this one and that one, the third world war will be on water, and this one is fighting for more water, that country is taking the water away. Instead of that, it was actually the framework, the directive was, and, and you know, it was fostering cooperation between nations. But above all, what was very interesting was that it got, uh, in one single, in unity, it got the people from the different nations coming together in a single framework of legislation to solve the problems of wa Europe's waters, getting them cleaner, managing water on a river basin level rather than according to country. That's a blueprint for the world. You know, that kind of law, environmental law, is what we should all be looking at, aspiring to. So man's upholding, man's laws should be upholding nature's laws. And those are real environmental laws. That's what's worth fighting for. And we should learn and make laws that echo that harmony that's given to us by nature and her laws and defend them to our last breath. So I urge all you young law students uh, who are learning environmental law that whenever you're looking at law, look at it. Is it in harmony with what nature has given us? Nature gives us laws that says, you've got clean, here's clean, look after it, do this, and the water will be clean and give you health, okay? So do our laws mimic that law? Keep that in mind when you're looking at the laws. Are you fighting for them? Are you making them? At all points, do our laws, can our environment laws mimic nature's laws? Um, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. And um, I look forward to interacting with you further. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, explaining the topic in such a coherent manner. Now we will move to our further seg segment that is the question answer session. We will maintain the same chronology in which our distinguished guests addressed our attendees. So my first question goes to Ms. Krishni Elpado, ma'am. Ma'am, with your permission. Yes. Hmm. Ma'am, we have seen that natural resources have started reviving naturally amid COVID lockdown across several nations. The carbon level has also reduced. What steps can be taken on legal and governance front to carry forward this positive impact in the post-COVID recovery state that you uh, talked about in your speech? Yes, so um, as I've mentioned, there have been many positive signs um, in the natural world. Uh, we have seen um, some signs that, um, you know, nature is healing. Um, I'm just, I'm going to give you an example, uh, what is happening in Mauritius. Um, so in my country, uh, lately, um, the government <clears throat> has been, um, has uh, 
been uh, taking action on that uh, level. For example, we have a new regulation right now, which has just uh, come out last week. And many environmentalists are celebrating the fact that as from now, um, single use plastic uh, is banned in Mauritius. Uh, so that's a very good uh, sign for the environment. And um, another thing I think that in terms of, uh, you know, environment uh, conservation and to uh, continue the positive things that we're seeing right now that is happening over the world. I think, uh, as was mentioned by the previous speakers, um, there needs to be more stringent laws uh, and not only stringent laws, but enforcement of these laws. So I think the weakness that we have right now in our environmental uh, laws, uh, especially in my own country, is that um, there are laws pertaining to the environment, but these laws are not being enforced um, by, you know, um, the the regulatory institutions that exist so i think first of all uh, to uh, protect nature to protect the environment these laws that we have uh, uh, regarding the environment they should be enforced uh, and also now is the time to realize that you know we can't be uh, making excuses so uh, for example um, in the past, uh, we had policymakers, uh, we had government officials which were using the excuse and saying that, okay, so we can't have strict laws uh, because we need the economic imperative. Uh, if we're going to uh, put a stop to fossil fuel industries, then, you know, this is going to have an economic impact on the uh, uh, on uh, the country. But we have seen now, for example, if you use less cars, if you work from home, for example, uh, this is possible. Uh, so even in Mauritius for, uh, for a long time, the government has uh, been uh, very slow in implementing uh, you know, policies for work from home, for example. But now with the COVID pandemic, all of a sudden we're realizing that, you know, uh, not everyone has to uh, take their car and, you know, move from home to their workplace to work. And we know the amount of um, emissions that occurs on the roads because of, you know, vehicles. So I think um, to, we have to adopt, first of all, uh, good habits and second of all uh, second we need to have these laws that are enforced um, and we need to have a, a change in the way we do things so that we can continue with the positive signs that we're seeing in um, in this uh, new uh, uh, in in the new uh, world uh, world order that we're seeing thank you ma'am mm, my next question to you is uh, to, re uh, to reduce the usage of fossil fuels, uh, electric vehicles are seen as the next step for clean energy, but the, uh, there's a problem with disposing of batteries, which is a major pollutant. So in this manner, what will be the possible future on the environment context? Yes, so first of all, we need to be aware that, you know, um, a lot has been said um, about moving, uh, you know, to electric cars. Um, but we have to understand that the electric, where does the energy uh, come from, uh, you know, if we have to use electric cars, obviously we have, there has to be an energy source. And if this comes from fossil fuel, so again, we're not solving the problem. Uh, we're just uh, putting a mask on what we're doing and that's not actually a solution. So I'm, I'm not uh, very convinced uh, in the first place with the use of, with uh, saying that electric cars are, you know, better than, uh, for example, other forms of energy that uh, coal or gas, for example. Um, so in terms of the electric batteries, uh, I think, uh, as I've said, so there, if there are countries which are moving to uh, the use of electric cars. So I think um, they need to have a regulatory body. They need to have an institution or a set of laws governing, uh, you know, the, uh, how this is going to be, to be implemented. So I think it's very important before putting forward uh, a new policy or uh, changing the way things are being done. I think uh, governments, um, should be well aware of, you know, um, the detriments that 
this uh, new way of doing things is going to have uh, the, the impact that is going to have on the environment and cater for uh, solutions before uh, putting in place um, these uh, new ways of doing things. So I think there needs to be laws uh, and there needs also to be an institution or there needs to be a body uh, taking care of how these uh, batteries are going to be disposed of, uh, whether you know they can be used for other purposes and whether uh, uh, they should not be, for example, dumped uh, openly. So there should be uh, a proper means of disposing of um, these batteries. Thank you, ma'am. My next question goes to Advocate Dr. Shadna Mahashabde, ma'am. Ma With your permission. Yeah, sure, sure. Ma'am, the question is from our attendee, one mm -hmm. of our attendees. We all, are, uh, all have witnessed less pollution and cleaner air due to global lockdown or less human activity, which gave Mother Nature a chance to revive itself. Yes. Do you think that such lockdown on human activity should be imposed on proper intervals to maintain the balance? Um, because this uh, lockdown is having several other impacts on socio-economic aspect uh, is concerned. So uh, we do have a certain uh, restrictions or uh, for the uh, non-polluting techniques. So we need to adopt that uh, just for the sake of uh, uh, reducing a pollution, we cannot enforce lockdown. How difficult it is to enforce a lockdown, we all know, besides the threat of the life, uh, uh, imposing that lockdown was such a difficult thing. So uh, I don't think that's the solution for it. We do have uh, n number of uh, other uh, ways to uh, curb the pollution. We need to go for that. Ma'am, thank yes. you, ma'am. My second question is, uh, we have advanced in terms of technology on a global front, dealing with air pollution and other pollution aspects. Yes. But uh, in India, uh, we have seen uh, seen that it still lacks in tackling air pollution in terms of technological advancement. So uh, what would you suggest to the respective authorities to mm -hmm. deal with such critical issues like air pollution? Sure. Here, uh, actually, uh, we do have an Air Act, which is mainly dealing with the industries. Uh, and as far as the air pollution is concerned, around 60% or 70% of the chunk of the air pollution is by the motor uh, uh, vehicles. And the Motor Vehicle Act is in, cannot be controlled. And uh, in this, a social awareness is required. And um, the uh, people need to uh, uh, shift for the public transport and all other alternatives for reducing the uh, emission by the motors is required. Uh, that is a very important aspect. And the implementation of the air pollution also need to be taken care. Uh, there are other uh, so many issues. But I think as far as the uh, uh, as we say that uh, motor vehicles are polluting 60 to 70 percent chunk, which is um, mostly unattended. If we focus and on that also, we could uh, achieve a lot. And whereas, of course, stringent rules MPCB has to enforce for the industries. Thank you so much, ma'am to dealing with that legal front on the, uh, on this question. Now I will move ahead with Nasir Ali Abdullah, sir. Sir, with your permission. Sir. I guess there is some network issue on the source front, so we will move ahead with uh, Mini Jan, ma'am. Ma'am, we have a question. Mm -hmm. You have rightly talked of natural resources being commercialized, especially water. We are experiencing 
the commercialization of natural resources in uh, form of rising sea levels how sea levels have raised and other uh, pandemic issues like covid tsunami and other things so how far combined commitment is needed to avoid such pandemic in future and what are the possible steps that can be taken for the same this is one question that our attendees have raised okay okay so these are huge global problems i mean uh, uh, it's very easy to give a huge global answer but really any change that happens begins with the self and it begins in your region it begins um, in 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 your area so um, if we really want to take a make make steps we we don't know um you know uh, how we can contribute at a global level but the way to contribute at the global level is to make a change at the local level so find out in your area what is it that can be done in take for example the pandemic okay uh, wearing masks uh, being safe washing your hands looking after the poor in your region looking after them especially i've seen horrific pictures of migrants having to leave the cities and go back to their villages where neither do they have food nor water looking after them those are small steps which we can take big steps for the people who don't have the food and water but those are small steps which we can take which then are the building blocks of the larger change that we look for in the system uh, there's no one step that i can say you do this and rising sea levels will stop it's small steps that build the foundation for change so start with yourself look around start with your area start with your region look around and look at the steps that you yourself can take thank you ma'am my next question to is regarding the rising pollution in the ocean we deal with the same topic yesterday also where uh, ma'am deal with the topic regarding to dumping of waste in ocean as per your opinion what policy changes on global front is needed to deal with such situation what we recently saw in russia like the oil spill and what is happening uh, in the oceans where medical waste and other things are being dumped so what is your views on that uh, aspect i think there uh, i don't think there are policies or laws which say yes we should dump the uh, rubbish into the ocean mm -hmm. so categorically saying that i don't think there is any law that says yeah 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 let's go and dump it into the ocean but uh, there are exceptions and there are ways to get around that which is what is what we are currently seeing even in the presentation i was talking about they achieved a certain amount but the balance amount they didn't achieve in terms of clean water uh, the larger bit was simply because there are exemptions or there are ways to get around it so um it, uh, once we find i mean the the way to look into that is first find out start with yourself where does your waste go hmm? uh is there a separation of waste is there composting or uh, is all the waste being collected together and dumped into one municipal dump and then the municipal dump is taken into a larger bit and then we don't know what happens look at the chain start with yourself hmm? so at a global level then you will understand what is the change uh, the, not just the change what is the uh, chain what is the route from your waste leaving your house to where it is being dumped is it being dumped in uh, the ocean or is it actually being taken care of safely um it's very easy to look at other countries and uh, you know put point our fingers uh, uh, at them but we should look at our own countries first look at our own selves first if we are doing ev everything right then we can point our fingers to the others no so i think that's a problem that all countries have not just uh, russia not just uh, um, uh, india and not just the uk Uh, you know they they are sophisticated and varying to a degree but there are some nations who have uh, really strict laws look into those your law students look into those laws and look into those countries where the laws are being implemented successfully what are they doing right and then lobby with that information in your hand once you know where those laws are working and what they're doing and how they're doing it rightly it it's it works then as a way of bringing about change with the laws in your country thank you so much ma'am that was uh, really enlightening as a law student that what approach we should carry out forward now i would like and request yes to take over yes
Thank you, Parth. Um, and thank you to all our inquisitive and enthusiastic participants who sent us their questions. We hope their intellectual thirst to quench their, to quench their mental horizons with this prudent knowledge was ably affected. This, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the close of our maiden two-day international conference on the perspectives of global governance in the pandemic era, spread across two days and with speakers participating from three continents and six countries, this has been an overwhelming experience for all of us. The larger message of humanity standing together in these trying times stands firmly etched in the memories of all the participants present and those generations hence. It is indeed, now we move to the vote of thanks. It is indeed my proud privilege to propose the vote of thanks for today's penultimate webinar on behalf of the environment cell Bharti Vidya Peet, deemed to be University New Law College, Pune. We would like to express our sincere thanks to our distinguished panelists, Mrs. Vandana Shiva, founder Navdanya International, Mr. Siddharth Prasad, lecturer OP Jindal University, Mr. Nasir Ali, senior fac faculty Dukan University, Mrs. Krishna Apado, lecturer University of Mauritius, advocate Dr. Sadhana Mahashabde, chairpersons Global, Global Envire Solutions, and Mrs. Mini Jain, Director General Operations, FPUK, who with their ingenuity and avid insights helped us to better understand the topic at the outset we would like to pay rich tributes to our founder chancellor, Dr. Patang Rao Kadamsa, because of whose blessings this event has been a great success. Our special thanks to our principal, Dr. Bhagyashi Desh Pandeman, a woman of high morals and values who nurtured the concept of having a dedicated environment cell in our college. Equally, we feel immeasurable gratification thanking our chief coordinator, Dr. Jyoti Dharma Ma'am, and our faculty coordinator, Dr. J. Shri Khandari, ma'am, who have been the pillars of strength of our environment cell and have actively guided us in all our pursuits. Finally, adapting to this new mode of interaction has been made possible by the tireless efforts or have made our digital presence a class. In the end, let me thank each and every conference. Thank you to all. May I have a photo? Thank you. It is request to everyone, please on your camera so that we can take one group photo. Okay, done. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.